Come to order a quorum being present without objection. The chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Pursuant to committee rule two and house rule 11 clause two, the chair may postpone further proceedings today on the question of approving any measure or matter or adopting an amendment for which a recorded vote for the A's and A's are ordered. I'd like to remind members that we have established an email address and distribution list dedicated to circulating amendments, exhibits, motions, or other written materials that members might want to offer as part of our markup today. If you'd like to submit materials, please send them to the email address that has been previously distributed to your offices, and we will circulate the materials to members and staff as quickly as we can. I would also remind all members that guidance from the Office of Attending Physicians states that face coverings are required for all meetings in an enclosed space, such as committee markups, except when recognized to speak. Finally, I would ask all members, both those in person and those appearing remotely, to mute your microphones when you are not speaking. This will help prevent feedback and other technical issues. You may unmute yourself anytime you seek recognition. Pursuant to notice, I now call up H.R. 4777, the Non-Debtor Release Prohibition Act of 2021 for purposes of markup, and move that the committee report the bill favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 4777 to amend Title 11, United States Code, to prohibit non-consensual- Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. I will begin by recognizing myself in an opening statement. H.R. 4777, the Non-Debtor Release Prohibition Act of 2021, would address some of the most extreme abuses of the corporate bankruptcy system that have come to light in recent years. The bankruptcy system is supposed to work for everyone, but in many cases it works only for the powerful. And too often it works best for big corporations and the very wealthy who have not even filed for bankruptcy, but who have figured out how to twist the system to obtain blanket immunity for their wrongdoing. These entities, to borrow a term coined by Professor Lindsay Simon, are bankruptcy grifters that leech off another bank entity's bankruptcy to hide their misdeeds, silence victims, and secure their ill-gotten payouts. H.R. 4777 targets three forms of this abusive conduct. The first, which gained renown during the recent Purdue Pharma bankruptcy proceeding, is the lifetime get-out-of-jail free card known as a non-consensual, non-debtor release. Under this tactic, the Sackler family, who had not filed for bankruptcy themselves or incurred any of the associated costs, were able to reap one of the biggest rewards of the bankruptcy code by receiving sweeping immunity for their role in precipitating the opioid crisis over the, over the objections of many of their victims. And it's not just the Sacklers and their accomplices who are abusing the bankruptcy system. These tactics are also being utilized by the people and institutions that enabled Larry Nassar to sexually abuse hundreds of girls and young women, by those who enabled the criminal acts of Harvey Weinstein and the authority figures and surrogate parents who sexually abused uncounted scores of Boy Scouts and young parishioners or enabled that abuse. That abusive practice would be prohibited under H.R. 4777. This legislation would also limit tactics known as non-debtor stays and injunctions, which also allow a non-debtor to avail itself of the benefits of the bankruptcy process without assuming the obligations and procedural safeguards associated with bankruptcy. Under the bill, Non-consensual preliminary stays and injunctions can only last up to 90 days. Finally, the legislation limits the use of so-called divisional mergers, which allow a corporation to shield its assets from its victim and other creditors. Under this tactic, a corporation divides itself into two entities, <coughs> one with the bulk of its liabilities and the other with the bulk of its assets. The entity carrying the liabilities then files for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. This scheme was used most recently by Johnson & Johnson, which faces substantial liability for the cancer-causing asbestos found to be present for decades in its talc-based products. Although the company is clearly solvent, last month it elected to spin off a new subsidiary carrying the company's talc-related liabilities, which then declared bankruptcy in an attempt to shield the remaining company's assets from being used to compensate injured victims. <coughs> H.R. 4777 would therefore require the dismissal of any bankruptcy case brought by a company whose liabilities were the product of a divisional merger that was intended or had the foreseeable effect of separating a corporation's assets from its liabilities. 
This legislation builds off the important work <coughs> of subcommittee chairman Cicilline and oversight committee chairwoman Carolyn Maloney, who has conducted a thorough investigation of the role of the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma in the opioid crisis. This bill would also not exist if it were not for the brave victims, survivors, affected families, and advocates who have come forward to testify about the harm caused by these bankruptcy abuses. We heard from two of these survivors at a subcommittee hearing earlier this year. Tara Schweikert Moser, a bronze medal Olympic gymnast and one of scores of survivors of sexual abuse at the hands of the Olympic team doctor Larry Nasser explained how, quote, wealthy corporations abuse the bankruptcy process by forcing victims to release their claims against them, sometimes without putting in a penny in the pot to compensate them, close quote. She continued, each athlete like me who endured this hell and sexual abuse by Olympic doctor Larry Nasser deserves the ability to make the choice on how they will seek justice. This bankruptcy abuse must stop. Alexis Pleus, or Pleus, the founder and director of Truth Farm, who has become a tireless advocate for the victims and survivors of the opioid epidemic after she lost her son, Jeff, whose addiction began with an OxyContin prescription, testified, quote, while Jeff can't be returned to me, nor any of the other lives lost, what we can do is close the loophole that is allowing the Sacklers and others to profit from the death and destruction they have caused. And that is not only my request to you today, but the request of the thousands of individuals and families that I have met and sold and heard from over the past seven years, close quote. I hope that the members of this committee will stand with these victims today and vote in favor of H.R. 4777. I now recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. People around the country are suffering as a result of the opiate epidemic. There is no doubt that it has harmed millions of Americans. It's a national tragedy and one that has hit uh, my home state of Wisconsin particularly hard. The most immediate impetus for this bill comes from the Purdue Pharma bankruptcy case. Purdue, of course, is the manufacturer of OxyContin. Just to be clear, no one here condones wrongful behavior by the Sackler family or Purdue's role in the opiate epidemic. Purdue's bankruptcy is currently on appeal and there are other pending cases raising similar legal and policy issues. Purdue's bankruptcy and the bill we are considering concern a developing area of bankruptcy law, as you stated. There is currently a circuit split on the question of when bankruptcy judges have authority to bless releases of liability for non-debtors to help resolve mass tort claims. Third-party releases are rarely approved when creditors object to the sufficiency of what they're getting in exchange for the third-party release. Third-party releases are more likely to be approved when they increase settlement funds that plaintiffs ultimately get, or when litigation risks outside of the bankruptcy context could leave some plaintiffs with less of a recovery, or perhaps a similar recovery, but significantly delayed. Tying the hands of bankruptcy judges and preventing their consideration of proposed bankruptcy settlements that include these types of releases may lead to unintended consequences for plaintiffs. If this bill becomes law, it will make the difficult task that bankruptcy courts have even harder by, making, by taking away some of their current tools to get equitable relief. We must be careful not to do anything that would inadvertently limit the ability of a bankruptcy court to use every possible tool to reach an equitable outcome. But this is not the only troubling part of this bill. This bill goes well beyond non-debtor releases. For example, because these bankruptcy cases often involve hundreds or thousands of litigants, by creating a 90-day limitation on the time period of bankruptcy negotiations with third parties, the bill makes it less likely that the parties will come to a voluntary settlement agreement and the bill's section on divisional mergers will have significant repercussions for American businesses. There are a number of reasons that a company might embark on a divisional merger, reasons far from a planned bankruptcy filing. For example, a corporation may divide its assets and liabilities into new entities in order to obtain financing. 
in order to sell off parts of that company or for other reasons that are in the interests of the company's shareholders, workers, or customers. This bill would punish these types of legitimate and useful practices by its revisions to the bankruptcy code. At the end of the day, while parts of this bill may be well-intentioned, it will likely result in unintended consequences that could be harmful to all parties involved in many bankruptcy proceedings. And I yield back. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. I now recognize myself for purposes of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 4777 offered by Mr. Nadler of New York. Strike all after the enacting clause. Without objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute will be considered as read and shall be considered as base text for purposes of amendment. I will recognize myself to explain the amendment. This amendment in the nature of a substitute addresses a number of typographical errors and grammatical issues in the underlying text of the bill. It also inserts a cross-reference to, to subsection 113C into subsection 113B in order to make clear that subsection B provides an exclusive list of ex exceptions to the general prohibition on non-debtor releases. Otherwise, it makes no substantive changes to the bill, and I urge all members to support the amendment. Are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? For what purpose does Mr. Cicilline seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'm proud to have joined you and Chairwoman Maloney as original co-sponsors of the Non-Debtor Release Prohibition Act of 2021. The cornerstone of our bankruptcy code is fairness. Fairness is essential to a system that Congress designed to determine who should get what when hardworking, honest Americans need a fresh start or in the case of Chapter 11 bankruptcies, when corporations cannot pay their debts. But in recent years, massive institutions and powerful individuals have abused this process to evade accountability for some of the most horrifying conduct imaginable. The Sackler family, which made billions off the opioid epidemic they helped create, has abused the bankruptcy of the company they own, Purdue Pharma, to secure a lifetime immunity from civil liability for what they have done. Child abusers and their enablers are using the bankruptcies of the Boy Scouts of America and the Catholic Diocese to ensure that they will never have to answer for their crimes. And the people and organizations that allow Larry Nasser to sexually abuse hundreds of young women for years are using the bankruptcy of USA Gymnastics to avoid a reckoning. These entities cloak their abuses in terms that are almost impenetrable to anyone not intimately familiar with bankruptcy law. Terms like non-consensual, non-debtor releases, Temporary, temporary stays, and divisional mergers. Few people could possibly know that these devices often serve as tools to undermine the checks and balances that are supposed to prevent powerful, lawless corporations and corporate insiders from rigging the Chapter 11 process in their favor to evade justice. This is a systemic problem that is plaguing our justice system. We've heard from numerous victims, survivors, and families who are caught up in these and other bankruptcies that have been weaponized to silence them and to shield wrongdoers from accountability. They told us that unless something changed, it would happen again and again and again. This must end. We cannot allow these complete, the complete and total misuse of the bankruptcy system to escape the reckoning that the law must provide. This important legislation would prevent individuals who have not filed for bankruptcy from obtaining releases from lawsuits. It would also provide other meaningful changes to address this problem, including prohibiting the use of so-called divisional mergers in the bankruptcy process to shield a corporation from liability for their misconduct. Before closing, I want to recognize the leadership of Chairman Nadler, who has pushed tirelessly to safeguard and advance the rights of workers, students, and consumers in the bankruptcy system. I also want to acknowledge the hard work of my friend Chairwoman Maloney and her team on the Committee on Oversight and Reform for their commitment to exposing the harm the Sacker family and their hand-picked executives at Purdue Pharma have done to this country and its citizens for giving a voice to the families caught up in the crisis the Sacklers spawned, and for shining a light on the Sacklers' efforts to turn the bankruptcy system into an accomplice for their crimes. I urge my colleagues to support H.R. 4777, and I yield back. Thank you. 
The gentleman yields back for our purposes, Mr. Cohen, seek recognition. Thank you. To strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This issue is personal to my district, personal to all women of color, because it directly affected them and it was aimed at them. For decades, Johnson & Johnson sold a product known as known carcinogen, asbestos. Although they repeatedly denied it, documents have revealed that the company executives knew of their asbestos problems as early as the 1970s. Asbestos is in the talc they mined and put in their baby powder. By exposing consumers to asbestos, Johnson & Johnson has inflicted deadly diseases such as ovarian cancer and mesothelioma on its consumers primarily on women of color, who they knowingly targeted in marketing this dangerous product. In my district alone, there are over 60 people whose lives have been damaged by the actions of Johnson & Johnson. Through no fault of their own, consumers have been knowingly exposed to this dangerous carcinogen that has wreaked havoc on their lives and the lives of their loved ones. Johnson & Johnson knew it and marketed their product to people of color, and they should pay for the intentional harm that they have inflicted. I personally know of these impacts of this asbestos exposure as someone who has been closely affected by the death of a close friend to methicillioma. I believe companies like Johnson & Johnson should be held responsible for the harms they've caused. But as often as the case, Johnson & Johnson, among others, have abused the bankruptcy system to shirk responsibility and avoid accountability. They've taken what's known as the Texas two-step, dividing their assets, dividing their company, with the assets in one company and the liabilities in another, and then they go to North Carolina to bankrupt. They have done this by making this divisive merger, the Texas two-step, splitting their company apart, saddling the newly found, formed entity with the liabilities they've incurred with harming consumers and having to file for bankruptcy. The result is a company that's worth almost a half a trillion dollars, $450 billion, uses bankruptcy to avoid responsibility they have to the people that they have brought such pain and suffering to. This bill would stop this from happening by amending the federal bankruptcy law to ensure that we do not allow this end run around the law to continue to be used by these corporations. This was not what the bankruptcy law was intended to be for. One of my predecessors, Congressman Chandler, who served here in the late 30s and in the 1940s, uh, was one of the primary authors of bankruptcy laws in this country. And Memphis has many, many bankruptcies. We're a bankruptcy capital because we have so many poor people. And now we have poor people saddled with medical debts because of Johnson & Johnson's use of this carcinogenic agent in, in their talcum powder. This is an important bill to protect consumers and ensure that companies like Johnson & Johnson are made to pay for the damage they've caused. Most of them, again, to women of color and Hispanic women who they intentionally marketed their product to. They knew what they were doing and now they're trying to get away with it. Some of those women need to bankrupt because of high medical bills. Medical bills are one of the predominant causes of bankruptcy, and they're getting out of it with the Texas two-step. We should not allow this to happen. This is just morally reprehensible. I urge my colleagues to support me in, in passing this bill. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purposes Mr. Bishop seek recognition? Maybe to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Um, you know, bankruptcy, nothing about bankruptcy is fun. You're taking an enterprise that, for whatever reason, has found itself unable to pay its debts, and, you're, and the court has to deal with it and address uh, the issues as best it can. In Chapter 11, where big, successful, going concerns are entering bankruptcy to be reorganized, the whole idea there is you have a valuable going concern. Since Mr. Cohen's cited J&J, &J, let's talk about that. That's an enormous enterprise. Pharmaceuticals, I mean, medical devices, think of all the things Johnson & Johnson produces. Even talcum powder. Maybe we're glad that there's the production of talcum powder and that's available in the United States. I mean, I think to say that seems obvious. In the case, if, if there ends up a situation, if indeed there's a claim for relief because asbestos was in talcum powder, and that creates an enormous liability not known of until later down the road, then what bankruptcy is designed to do in part is to harvest the value of the enterprise that's, that's uh, 
that, that um, created the situation and make that available to claimants, but to allow the business underlying Johnson & Johnson to go on. And it's critical that the bankruptcy law do that in a way that is efficient and lets resources be reallocated in short, in short order in order to accomplish that purpose so that jobs continue and consumer products are available that are extraordinarily important. The problem with this bill is it takes a couple of examples where there has been um, over, uh, uh, improper use or poor decisions in the court system and seeks to absolutely alter the bankruptcy code so that judges can't serve the purpose I just described. Uh, over the course of time, bankruptcy courts all over the country have evaluated the question of non-debtor releases. Some, some circuit courts of appeals have developed uh, factor, multi-factor tests that a bankruptcy judge has to go through before allowing a non-consensual non-debtor release. A couple of courts, circuit courts of appeals have said, no, judges, broad equitable power to fix these things and so that they can, so that you can achieve this economic efficiency as described, doesn't include the power to grant a non-debtor release. Um, by the way, uh, the other problem the bill uh, speaks to about uh, separating liabilities into a separate corporate entity to try to uh, uh, evade an attack on the main J&J, &J, as Mr. Cohen just described, yeah, that's been filed in North Carolina, but Craig Whitley, the bankruptcy judge there, has at least preliminarily said he's not going to allow that to succeed. So the bankruptcy court system has a lot of history, a lot of expertise in the bankruptcy court, uh, bench the the judges and I don't you know in the hearing that we had on this we had folks who've suffered grievous harm and are very sympathetic persons um, who've come in and talked about a couple of occasions where this may have been I, I, Purdue Pharma probably mishandled uh, and I think as I said before that there might be adjustments in terms of venue where where cases can be brought and assignment policies which bankruptcy judge may get cases over and over to prevent abuses but this is like a meat cleaver approach that this committee has not taken the time to inform itself by asking the bankruptcy bench and those who practice bankruptcy law all the time in this area how much damage this is going to do. And after last night, I would think it'd be a time to step back and take a more moderate approach rather than throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, can't support this bill in its current form, but I'd be delighted to work on the issue. Just think coming in and, and wreaking havoc in the bankruptcy system is not the way to fix it. Now yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purposes does Ms. McBath seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. I thank you, Chairman Natler, for introducing this legislation to ensure that our bankruptcy system is not abused to let people off the hook for corporate wrongdoing. When we had a meeting, uh, we had a hearing about this legislation, we heard heartbreaking stories from people who could not seek justice because of these liability loopholes. And we heard from a mother who lost her son to an overdose. She came to tell her own story and the stories of thousands of families who have lost someone to addiction that started with a prescription drug that they were told was safe. And too many of us know someone who lost someone to an addiction or who faced that addiction but found the support to survive. <laughs> but far fewer people realize that our bankruptcy courts are being used to let those responsible keep all the money that they made while families continue to lose their loved ones. This is just wrong, and we know it. Similarly, the House and Senate Judiciary Committees have heard from our incredible Olympic athletes who experienced sexual assault because they trusted that their doctor was there to help them and that their coaches and representatives would work to keep them safe. Here, too, loopholes in our bankruptcy system have prevented them from getting the justice that they deserve. I thank you, Chairman Nettler, for raising awareness of how our system is failing us and for bringing this legislation to make it right. Our families, our young athletes, and our country, we all know they deserve better. 
And I am proud to support this legislation, and I encourage all of my colleagues to support it as well. And I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does Ms. Scanlon seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. In recent years, we've seen powerful corporations misuse our bankruptcy code to avoid liability for knowingly exposing Americans to dangerous substances or conduct in order to protect their profits or responsible parties. So today's markup of the Non-Debtor Release Prohibition Act of 2021 could not be more timely. Corporations are using non-consensual non-debtor release to spin off their liability in bankruptcy cases, protecting their immense assets from creditors and those seeking restitution for corporate misconduct. Hundreds of thousands of Americans died as a direct result of the Sackler family's decisions to promote the use of OxyContin with misleading data. And the family grew enormously wealthy by some estimates reaching a net worth of $13 billion. But when the victims and families of victims came forward to seek accountability, much of the Sacklers' enormous personal wealth will be protected. The Sackler family has used our bankruptcy system to shield their assets by receiving broad immunity from financial liability in a class action suit against the company they own, Purdue Pharmaceuticals. This has been a strategy used by powerful corporations for years and will continue to be used so long as these loopholes remain open. Recently, Johnson & Johnson was in the news for attempting this very same strategy attempting to shield its assets from a lawsuit regarding cancer-causing asbestos in its ubiquitous baby powder. As thousands of individuals go into medical debt from cancer related to J&J baby powder, the company itself is trying to use the bankruptcy system to avoid paying its own debts. This is exactly what Congress should do. When we find that a law is being abused, we should use our legislative powers to prevent that misuse. Passing the Non-Debtor Release Prohibition Act of 2021 through this committee will bring us one step closer to ensuring that creditors and victims, Americans, are granted just restitution. I urge my colleagues to vote yes on this legislation, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, for what purpose does the gentlelady from Houston, Texas, want to be congratulated on the victory of the Houston Astros? despite the fact that the New York Yankees deserve to win every year. Uh, so what purpose does the gentlelady seek recognition? I'll take that, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, first, to, um, to acknowledge the importance of this legislation and strike, strike the last, last word. word. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will um, associate uh, myself with uh, the statement of the chairman. Uh, the statement of uh, my colleague, Mr. Cicilline, thank uh, Congressman Maloney, uh, and as well associate myself with the words of Congressman Cohen. I just want to take a moment to focus on a specific part of the uh, Non-Debtor Release Prohibition Act of 2021, uh, which is the part that prohibits the use of non-central non-debtor releases uh, in a bankruptcy case. Uh, and as it is defined, uh, to uh, get a release uh, called a third-party release, it is a provision in a plan of reorganization releasing claims by a party in bankruptcy against an entity that is not filed for bankruptcy protection. Uh, and as well, we know that there are two forms, consensual releases and non-consensual releases, which means it is against the interests of the creditors. And frankly, I don't believe there is a uh, convincible argument that would suggest that you could, in actuality, offend a creditor that come in all shapes and sizes. They are small businesses. They're medium-sized businesses. They're individuals. Uh, and those of us who practice law, who've been in the bankruptcy court, which I have for a, a long period of time, realize the massiveness of bankruptcy. Uh, in my own uh, community, there was an explosion in a neighborhood 
by a business. It was a medium-sized business, but it had been there for 40 or 50 years. But it had not been there as long uh, as it would be necessary to eliminate the rights of homeowners who were shocked in their beds at this explosion. Well, there was an immediacy of bankruptcy, and the numbers of person in the bankruptcy court were enormous. But they were small mom and pop. They were households. They were single parents living as head of household. And they had to go up against a more sizable corporate interest. I believe this legislation errs and falls, if there is an error, on the right side of justice. How do you take my rights of having the privileges of a court action or being heard in court without my consent? Meaning, how do you eliminate someone who is a culprit in an injustice, like the Sackle family, among many, and I have nothing to say. It may be that I am not in the bankruptcy court because I do not have the ability to have counsel. But for whatever judgment comes that I may be included as a class, I am eliminated from that because the direct culprit or a collaborating culprit who benefited in the opioid tragedy has now been removed and is intact and has their resources. And so, I understand my friends on the other side of the aisle in inquiring of judges uh, and having a long-winded process, but judges follow the law. And if Congress dictates this law, and it ultimately is signed by the President of the United States, bankruptcy courts follow the law. Uh, and they also can, in certain instances, interpret of the law as it proceeds in their court. But I don't believe that they have any sufficient argument to eliminate the rights of a creditor who falls far short in its power, her power, his power, its power, small business, neighborhood association, homeowners, that warrants not providing this legislation to eliminate the use of a non-consensual, non-debtor release that by its very nature, Mr. Chairman, negates, undermines, hinders, and harms small creditors across the nation. So I ask my colleagues to support H.R. 4777 because I think it falls on the right side of the interpretation of the protection of those who cannot protect themselves and who seek justice in our courts here in America. With that, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? For what purpose does the gentlelady seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of Chairman Nadler's bill, the Forced Arbitration Injustice Repeal Act. Bankruptcy courts were not developed and are not equipped to determine if corporate malfeasance has occurred. They provide for limited fact-finding, sometimes no testimony at all, at all, and rarely allow for a process for victims to prosecute their case. We have seen this story time and time again. First was Best Wall's asbestos bankruptcy, the case of Best Wall, formerly Georgia Pacific, and a subsidiary of Coke Industries, has been dragging on since 2017, and the asbestos victims have been enjoined from suing any of the other non-bankrupt Coke entities. We remember Johnson & Johnson has been sued for as asbestos in their baby powder. They have known since the 70s, and yet bankruptcy loopholes have been left ongoing claims continuing for years. Of course, you cannot discuss this issue without mentioning, as many here have, the Sackler family, who continue to avoid liability for their pervasive role in the opioid crisis. We have discussed this multiple times in this committee. We know the Sacklers used non-consensual, non-debtor releases to piggyback off Purdue Pharma's bankruptcy filing and evade liability for causing the addiction crisis. But what actions are they evading? More than 500,000 people in the United States have died from drug overdoses involving Sackler's opioids. 
and millions more suffer from opioid use disorder and addiction. The Sacklers through P Purdue aggressively cultivated relationships with academic hospitals to include their opioids in both treatment of patients and the training of the next generation of prescribers. The Sacklers argued in a marketing campaign that the drug was rarely addictive. And when challenged by journalists, the Sacklers sent it to lawyers to intervene. To combat the opioid crisis, prosecutors began treating overdose deaths not as tragedies, but as crimes, using tough statutes to charge the dealers who sold with sentences of 15 and 20 years. And yet the Sacklers, wildly, widely reviled for profiting from a public health crisis, continue to dodge accountability. The Sacklers have peddled, promoted, and covered up the powerfully addictive nature of opioids. Worse, they knew of the risk, and even lower, they used their power to slander victims. We've heard the story of Alexis Plias, who's, who lost her son, Jeff, in an overdose after he was instructed to take Oxycontin every four to six hours. While I commend her work on Truth Farm to continue to raise awareness of the importance of addiction and accountability for the people responsible, how many more Americans must be harmed or die before we intervene? Since the corporation has essential, essentially complete control over what assets and liabilities it assigns to the company in bankruptcy, the corporate wrongdoer has ultimate control over what damages, if any, are paid to victims. This bill will address the issue and prohibit companies from abusing the bankruptcy system to escape accountability for wrongdoing. In other words, this bill will protect the people we represent from these million dollar corporations. Without government accountability, we are not doing what we were elected to do. We are not protecting the American people. Without our action, the next Sackler family will do this again. Today, we have a chance to act. I thank the chairman and the committee for bringing forward this important issue and this legislation, and I urge my colleagues, all of my colleagues, to support it. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have a unanimous consent request. The gentleman will state it. I ask unanimous consent to introduce into the record a letter from Sally Greenberg of the National Consumers League and Remington Gregg of Public Citizen in support of the Non-Debtor Release Prohibition Act, a letter from Marcy Hamilton of Child USA and Catherine Robb of Child USA Advocacy in support of the Non-Debtor Release Prohibition Act, a letter from 57 individuals writing in support of H.R. 4777 on behalf of themselves and their family members who suffered from mesothelioma after using Johnson & Johnson's baby powder, a letter from more than 230 individuals writing in support of H.R. 4777 on behalf of themselves and their family members who suffered from ovarian cancer or mesothelioma after using Johnson & Johnson's baby powder, a letter from the National Consumers League and Public Citizen writing in support of H.R. 4777, a letter from more than 50 public interest and consumer protection organizations in support of H.R. 4777, and a letter from the National Consumer Law Center writing in support of H.R. 4077 is evident. Without objection, does anyone else seek recognition? In that case, the question occurs on the amendment nature of a substitute. This will be followed immediately by a vote on final passage of the bill. All those in favor respond by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Aye. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment nature of a substitute is agreed to. A reporting quorum being present, the question is on the motion to report the bill H.R. 4777 is amended favorably to the House. Those in favor, respond by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. No. no. The no. ayes have it, and the bill is ordered reported favorably. A recorded vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen? Aye. Mr. Cohen votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia? Aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Deutsch? Ms. Bass? Yes, aye. Ms. Bass votes aye. Mr. Jeffries? Thank you. With regard to the, uh... Mr. Cicilline. Aye. Mr. Cicilline votes aye. Mr. Swalwell. Aye. 
Mr. Liu. Aye. Mr. Liu votes aye. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin votes aye. Ms. Jayapal. Ms. Jayapal. Oh, I didn't say that. Uh, Ms. Jayapal, you're on mute. We'll have to come back to her. Ms. Demings. Aye. Ms. Demings votes aye. Mr. Correa. Correa votes aye. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Ms. Garcia. Aye. Ms. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Nagus? Aye. Mr. Nagus votes aye. Ms. McBath? Aye. Ms. McBath votes aye. Mr. Stanton? Aye. Mr. Stanton votes aye. Ms. Dean? Aye. Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar? Aye. Ms. Escobar votes aye. Mr. Jones. Ms. Ross. Ross votes aye. Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush. Bush votes aye. Ms. Bush votes aye. Mr. Jordan. No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Shabbat. No. Mr. Shabbat votes no. Mr. Gomert. Mr. Gomert votes no. Mr. Isa? Mr. Isa votes no. Mr. Buck? Mr. Gates? No. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? No. Mm -hmm. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes no. Mr. Biggs? No. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock? No. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Stubbe? Mr. Tiffany? Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey? No. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy? No. Mr. Roy votes no. Mr. Bishop? No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Ms. Fishbach? No. Ms. Fishbach votes no. Ms. Sparts? No. Ms. Sparts votes no. Mr. Fitzgerald? Mr. Fitzgerald votes no. Mr. Benz? Mr. Benz votes no. Mr. Owens? Owens, no. Mr. Owens votes no. Ms. Jayapal? Uh, let me. Let me uh, since we're having technical problems with Ms. Jayapal, um, uh, I would ask the clerk to turn around and Ms. Jayapal to indicate her vote by thumbs up or thumbs down. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Deutsch, you are not recorded. Uh, aye. Mr. Deutsch votes aye. Mr. Jones? Uh, Mr. Jones votes aye. Mr. Jones votes aye. Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Jeffries? Mr. Buck? Okay. Does anyone else seek recognition? Does anyone else uh, wish to? Does anyone who wish to be recorded who has not been recorded? The clerk Mr. Group. Chairman, able to hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm an I vote. 
we already had that, but thank you. <laughs> um, quick report. Mr. Chairman, there are 23 ayes and 17 noes. The bill is reported, the ayes have it. The bill, is, the bill is reported favorably to the House. Members will have two days to submit views without objection. The bill will re be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute, incorporate, and the staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. Pursuant to notice, I now call up H.R. 963, the Forced Arbitration and Justice Repeal Act, or the FAIR Act, for purposes of markup and move that the committee report the bill favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 963 to amend Title IX of the United States Code with respect to arbitration. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. I will begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. H.R. 963, the Forced Arbitration Injustice Repeal Act, or the FAIR Act, protects the rights of everyday consumers, workers, and small businesses by prohibiting the enforcement of forced arbitration clauses in consumer, labor, antitrust, and civil rights disputes. Nearly a century ago, Congress enacted the Federal Arbitration Act to allow merchants to resolve run-of-the-mill contract disputes in a system of private arbitration that would be legally enforceable. Congress intended this tool to be used voluntarily and only between merchants of equal bargaining power. However, in recent years, the Supreme Court has expanded the use of arbitration far beyond Congress's original intent, creating the unjust system we see today. Through a series of decisions, the court has transformed private arbitration from a voluntary forum for companies to resolve commercial disputes into a legal nightmare for millions of consumers, employees, small businesses, and others who are forced into arbitration and are unable to enforce certain fundamental rights in court. As a result, powerful corporations use forced arbitration as a tool to insulate themselves from accountability for abusing workers, consumers, and small businesses. By burying a forced arbitration clause deep in the fine print of take it or leave it contracts, companies can evade the justice system <coughs> where plaintiffs have far stronger legal protections and hide behind a one-sided process that is rigged in their favor. For example, arbitration generally limits discovery, does not adhere to the rules of civil procedure, can prohibit class actions, may have no right of appeal, and the proceedings, and often even the results, must stay secret, allowing companies to avoid public scrutiny of potential misconduct. For millions of consumers and employees, the precondition of obtaining a basic service or product such as a bank account, a cell phone, or even a job is that they must agree to resolve any disputes in private arbitration. Whether they know it or not, this means that their ability to enforce civil rights, consumer, labor, and antitrust laws are subject to the whims of a private arbitrator who is not required to provide plaintiffs any of the fundamental protections guaranteed in the courts. And for many companies, arbitration has become a get-out-of-jail-free card to circumvent the basic rights of consumers and workers. <coughs> As Professor Mir Miriam G Gillis of the Cardozo School of Law testified earlier this year, forced arbitration practice has eroded countless fundamental rights established by Congress by rendering them virtually unenforceable. As she explained, by secretly imposing these provisions in the small print of job applications, employment contracts, and consumer transactions, corporate executives have written their own rules, opting out of liability by shunting all cases against them into a private system of single file arbitration. H.R. 963, the FAIR Act, ends this shameful practice. Importantly, this legislation does not prevent parties from agreeing to arbitrate a claim after the dispute arises, which will ensure that arbitration agreements are truly voluntary and transparent. I applaud Congressman Johnson for his leadership on this bipartisan legislation, which currently has 201 co-sponsors. This measure is also supported by a broad coalition of more than 70 public interest organizations, including Public Citizen, Consumer Reports, the American Association of Justice, the Communication Workers of America, and the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights. And finally, 84% of Americans across the political spectrum support ending forced arbitration in employment and consumer disputes, according to recent polling data. 
H.R. 963, the FAIR Act, would restore access to justice to millions of Americans, and I urge all my colleagues to support this important legislation. I now recognize the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill nullifies otherwise legal contracts, contracts that often provide significant efficiencies for employers and employees as well as consumers. Pre-dispute arbitration <laughs> agreements are, are voluntary agreements between people that establish a process to resolve certain future disputes that may occur. The benefit of such agreements in practice is that the process of dispute resolution is often more efficient, effective, and timely than by using our federal court system to litigate. Banning pre-dispute arbitration agreements means that Americans will spend more time in court with no guarantee of a better outcome. Pushing Americans into the arms of the plaintiff's bar will also mean more litigation cost for job creators. And in a time of high inflation and during a supply chain crisis, Democrats want to put these increased burdens and cost on small businesses. Why? To help the trial bar. While large corporations will be able to afford large law firms to litigate disputes in court, smaller companies don't have that luxury. The Democrats want us to believe that this is a way to help workers stand up to big corporations, but I don't think that is true. This bill will hurt small and mid-sized employers who use and may even benefit, benefit more from arbitration agreements. This will be yet another cost added to their bottom line while they are already dealing with shipping delays, inflation, and the looming prospect of Democrat-sponsored higher taxes. And if workers cost more to hire, few workers are going to get jobs. We should reject this bill, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back without objection. All other opening statements will be included in the record. And I recognize myself for purposes of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 963 offered by Mr. Nadler of New York. Strike all after the amendment. Without objection, clause. the amendment in the nature of a substitute will be considered as read and shall be considered as base text for purposes of amendment. I will now recognize myself to explain the amendment. The amendment simply adds the phrase of 2021 to the bill's short title, but it makes no substantive changes to the bill. I urge members to support the amendment. And I yield back the balance of my time. Are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? For what purpose does Mr. Johnson seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank uh, you, Chairman, for uh, holding this markup on the FAIR Act, and I thank my 200-plus colleagues who are signed on as co-sponsors on this important legislation. And a special thank you to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates, for joining in this fight. Colleagues, there have been few times in American history when Congress has been as divided and polarized as we are now. But there's one thing that we can all agree upon, and that is the Constitution of the United States of America is one of the greatest documents ever written in the history of mankind. For 234 years, it has withstood the test of time. For 234 years, the Bill of Rights Amendments 1 through 10 of the Constitution have protected individual liberties and freedom. The 1st, 2nd, 4th, 5th, and 10th Amendments have often captured our attention, but the other five amendments are no less significant to the rights that they protect. The 6th Amendment guarantees the right to a speedy trial and a public trial by a fair and impartial jury and criminal proceedings. And the 7th Amendment guarantees the right to a trial by jury in civil cases where the value in controversy shall exceed $20. The Sixth and the Seventh Amendments guarantee access to justice in criminal and civil proceedings, respectively. And while the Sixth Amendment has held up well over the course of history, the Seventh Amendment right is no longer viable because of US Supreme Court decisions validating the use of forced arbitration clauses in agreements between wealthy and powerful business interests and consumers and workers. Lawsuits have proven to be a costly annoyance to corporations desiring to go about their business without having the threat of lawsuits seeking to hold them accountable when their conduct is wrongful. That is why they came up with the idea of hiding forced arbitration clauses in consumer and employment agreements. Nowadays, when a consumer goes in to buy a car, purchase a home, rent an apartment, 
open a bank account, open a credit card, make a purchase online, get a cell phone, obtain health insurance, put relatives in the nursing home, and even you want to start on a new job. In just about every contract between consumers and corporations, the little guy is forced to sign away their Seventh Amendment right to a trial by jury. Then when the consumer or worker gets treated badly and they want to sue, they discover that they can't do so because of the take it or leave it terms of service that they agreed to, which forces their dispute into the private for profit dispute resolution process known as arbitration. Forced arbitration was created as a for profit business by business for business. And it works well for big business because studies prove that in forced arbitration, the business just about always wins. Over the past several decades, forced arbitration clauses in consumer and employment agreements have become so widespread that you can't purchase anything or even take a job without being forced to agree to forced arbitration. It's always a take it or leave it situation for the little guy. Unlike the civil justice system, which has developed through centuries of statutes and case law, the forced arbitration process is not required to be based on the rule of law. The procedural rules and substantive law that a judge would apply in a court of law are not mandatory and often don't apply in an arbitration proceeding. In fact, instead of having a neutral and detached judge presiding over the case, an arbitrator is not even required to be a lawyer. Testimony is not required to be under oath subject to the penalty of perjury, and there is no requirement that a court reporter take down the proceedings so there is no right to a meaningful appeal on the merits when a party disagrees with the decision of the arbitrator. Moreover, arbitration is far from a public process with proceedings being held in privacy at secret locations. Forced arbitration fails to provide procedural guarantees of fairness and due process that are the hallmarks of courts of law and enable corporations to stack the deck against the little guy. The solution to this problem is to pass the FAIR Act to restore the Seventh Amendment right to a trial by jury in civil cases as the framers of our Constitution intended. And I ask for your support for this legislation, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop, seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I practiced uh, business law for, as a litigator for 29 years, mostly in disputes that were fairly modest in size, usually for small businesses or for people who are adverse to small businesses, many times employees. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I don't like arbitration. I don't prefer it personally. I knew the rules well. I could use them effectively. I like being able to appeal when a judge got it wrong. Things about court system are more fun for lawyers. Um, but they aren't necessarily always, it's not always best for clients. And sometimes arbitration will solve problems quicker and less expensive, in a less expensive way than will litigation. What we see in this bill um, is a lot like the last bill about the bankruptcy system. And again, as I say, I would think today would be a good day to begin taking a more attenuated, nuanced approach to things and leave the meat cleaver in the drawer. But unfortunately, this bill also takes the meat cleaver. Um, the bill doesn't just exempt some subjects from the reach of the Federal Arbitration Act, which renders arbitration agreements enforceable, in the subjects that the bill speaks to, it prohibits in, uh, arbitration agreements under, uh, it, whether, it, even if they're enabled by state law. Almost every state, if not every state, has an Arbitration Act also enabling or enforcing uh, arbitration agreements. Most of the subject matters of litigation or disputes that are identified in this bill are not federal law questions, not, not disputes arising out of federal law. They are state law controversies. 
And I can tell you that in the federal system, ending arbitration on a whole huge slew of subject matters will crush the federal court system. But that is nothing compared to what it will do to every state court system in the country. It will be an utter disaster in terms of responsiveness of those court systems. But worse than that, think about what it will do to small businesses. Every barbershop that wants to use arbitration to enforce a non-compete to prevent a stylist from pirating away their customer list. They can't go to arbitration anymore because that's an employment dispute. I represented oftentimes highly compensated individuals who sought commission compensation in large amounts from employers who had refused to pay it. They couldn't benefit from an arbitration prov uh, provision in their agreement. They would have to go through the litigation route under this immodest law that sweeps all across the country and, and every state court system. Uh, employment dispute, in fact, even is defined here as anything arising out of or related to the work relationship or prospective work relationship, even if you don't even have a work relationship yet, regardless of whether the individual is or would be classified as an employee or an independent contractor. Okay, what does that mean? Independent contractor would include, if you've ever operated a small business, your IT guy. He's, he's not an employee of your business. He's an independent, comes in and works for you on a fee-based service. If he wants to have in his contract a provision that says, if, if somebody cheats me on my bill, I'm going to take them to arbitration because I don't want to go to the burden of court, court system for just a collection matter. Well, guess what? The United States Congress is going to rule his arbitration agreement unenforceable too. This will bury... The federal court system, of course, is a system of limited jurisdiction. The state courts are the courts of general jurisdiction, where a huge swath of subject matters come to be determined. You will take every state law consumer dispute, every state law employment dispute, every state law independent contractor dispute involving an individual rendering a service, and you'll send them all into court, back up at the courthouse door, because it's going to take you years to get a resolution. This is the kind of immodest, intemperate, uninformed, reckless approach that this committee has taken again and again in my experience. It does no one good to satisfy yourself virtue signal about people who have been abused by such situations and destroy the system in the process. I yield back. For, uh, the gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Mr. Cicilline, seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to say before I begin my remarks that the example that my friend just used um, does not actually implicate this legislation. No one who is voluntarily chooses to participate in arbitration is denied the ability to do that post-dispute. That's just not true. This bill is intended to prevent forced arbitration where individuals don't have a choice. And so buried deep within the fine print of everyday contracts, forced arbitration, forced arbitration clauses block American consumers, workers, and small businesses from having their day in court, preventing them from holding corporations accountable for breaking the law before a dispute even arises. With the gentleman, you This private system, I will in a moment when I'm finished, this private system does not have the same procedural safeguards of our justice system, is not subject to oversight, has no judge or jury, is not bound by the laws passed by Congress or the states. And when forced arbitration is combined with non-disclosure agreements, that is to keep things secret, as they so often are, it effectively silences the victims of rampant corporate misconduct. As Gretchen Carlson testified earlier this Congress, the purpose of forced arbitration is clear, and I quote, she said, to keep any disputes secret and away from public scrutiny, end quote. Forced arbitration has also eroded the fundamental rights of our nation's men and women in uniform, veterans and their families. Since the Second World War, Congress has created many laws, including the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act, to expand and strengthen the rights and protections of service members and veterans. These laws are essential protections that guarantee every veteran, an active duty service member, 
including the reserves and National Guard, the right to be free from workplace discrimination on the basis of their military service, and the right to their day in court to enforce these protections. But for too long, arbitration has forced service members and their claims into a private system set up by corporations. This outrageous practice, and I want to give you an example. You know, everyone keeps talking about who this benefits. It's the plaintiff's bar. We heard testimony in the last Congress. Just one example from Kevin Zilber, who was a member of the Na US Navy who served his country uh, both in, uh, activated in Afghanistan on multiple occasions. He's deployed in service of his country. They have a celebration by his employer. They give him a cake shaped in the, of a, uh, the shape of an American flag, and they thank him for his service. And 15 minutes later, they fire him. And he says, you can't fire me. I'm protected under you, Sarah. And he goes to court, and buried in an employment contract he was asked to sign and paperwork he did for his job, was a forced arbitration clause. That is wrong. And that's what this bill will prevent from happening. This outrageous practice is nothing short of a corporate takeover of our nation's system of laws. And the American people have had enough. The overwhelming majority of voters, including 83% of Democrats and 87% of Republicans, support ending forced arbitration and restoring Americans' access to the courts. And it's time for us to act. H.R. 963, the FAIR Act, does just that. This important legislation ends the use of forced arbitration in everyday consumer, employment, antitrust, and civil rights disputes. I'd like to thank Chairman Nadler for considering this bill today, bringing it for markup, as well as my colleague, Congressman Johnson, for his extraordinary leadership on this issue for over a decade. And I urge my colleagues to support this measure, and I, I'm happy to yield to the gentleman for a question. I, think I hope maybe he's changed his mind now and he's supporting the bill. That's what he's about to report. Yeah, no, not quite. <laughs> um, but what I would like to do, you, you've, you've drawn a distinction between, um, you, you've described it as forced arbitration. I just want to, for the, for the clarification of anybody paying attention, am I correct that as to the subject matters it covers, this bill would prohibit enforcing any agreement that was signed between two parties on the, in any of those subject matters before the dispute arose. Yeah, my, uh, That's what you described reclaiming as my Yeah, reclaiming my time, this legislation would not, as you suggested in your five-minute speech, it would not prevent individuals who choose to participate in arbitration once a dispute arises from participating. What it would prevent is these clauses which are buried in contracts, often, most often, not known by the people who sign them, that in fact force arbitration pre-dispute. Even before someone knows there's gonna be a, an issue, they forced, yeah. they've been forced into the arbitration proceedings. Gentleman's time. That's what's wrong, and uh, with that I yield back. Okay. For what purpose does Mr. Biggs seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, I, th I thank the two gentlemen uh, for their discussion because one of the things that um, seemed interesting to me is um, is that the distinction here is on post dispute and pre dispute. So if you if you agree to arbitrate post dispute, this bill apparently allows that arbitration to go forward. But even if there is nothing buried, but if it is too individuals who seek to, upon entrance of that agreement, whether it's an employment agreement or the other, uh, the consumer, uh, consumer agreement or civil rights, whatever uh, antitrust issue, you cannot voluntarily, even if it's on a separate sheet of paper and, and everybody's looking at it and they both sign off, even if they both initialed and signed right next to the arbitration agreement in the contract um, early on before there's any dispute, this bill, under sec what looks like Section 402, seems to indicate that you cannot arbitrate. You have to then go to court, um, which seems to be kind of an imposition uh, on, on uh, two parties who seek to, to negotiate something. Would the gentleman yield? Um, uh, I'm going to yield here first to, to uh, Mr. Bishop of North Carolina. But I, I just want to, and, and we'll see how it goes from there, Mr. Mr. Bishop. 
I, I think the gentleman, and I'll try to cons uh, save as much time, Mr. Johnson, as you possibly did. can. But let me let me be clear about something. You know, I, if if we were only taking the huge American corporations and turning them over to the tender mercies of the class action trial lawyers, uh, so that they could have a lot more class actions, mm, I'm not sure I'd be worried too much about this bill. Uh, for me, the problem is is how how useful arbitration is across the landscape and how far this impairs it. So let me, if Mr. Cicilline would yield to an additional question, the what I uh, w wonder is if, if because we're, he uses the term forced arbitration and he's used this issue about, yeah, that's true. If you've had a dispute arises, rise, as say people have gotten into a conflict, it's got to be resolved, and then the two parties come to an agreement to arbitrate, this does nothing to that. But let me get at this one, Mr. Cicilline. If an executive makes uh, $10 million a year and he enters into a contract with his corporation and the very first provision at the very top in bold print says, if we have a dispute arising out of or relating to your employment agreement, uh, we're going to arbitrate it. And the, the executive signs it and the corporation signs it. And then there's a subsequently dispute over part of his $10 million compensation or her $10 million compensation. This bill would prohibit the enforceable enforcement of that arbitration agreement if he'd rather go to court. Isn't that right? Would, would Mr. Biggs yield to the uh, author of the legislation? To answer that question? Well, 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 so, okay, so I, I would, let's have Mr. Cicilline go and then he'll take a few seconds then I'll get back to you, Mr. Johnson. All right. Well, I, I, I feel bad that the author wants to answer the question. The answer is they are free to arbitrate. If both the parties agree and the dispute arises, they can arbitrate. Okay, so so I want to, before I yield to you, I, that, that's the same point I was I was trying to get at, Mr. Johnson, is, is pre-dispute at the entrance of the agreement, um, this bill looks like it prohibits uh, each party from agreeing to arbitration so later on they, they couldn't arbitrate. That's exactly correct. And there would be uh, one in a million opportunities for a $10 million corporate CEO to be affected by this legislation, but there are millions can, of Can I reclaim my time for a second? I'm going to come back to you, but I want to reclaim my time because I, I think of it as a different scenario. Dealing with small businesses in my district, um, it would not be unusual for a small mom and pop shop negotiating with an employee who becomes a key employee, and then they act, they come to a small, uh, you know, a small law firm, and they get in a, uh, they get this contract written up, and they have an arbitration clause in there. They, you could, even if they both sides initial and and that's that's highlighted. I read this as saying they would be prohibited from enforcing arbitration. I, and I think that's what you just said. Yeah, it, certainly. In accordance with the Seventh Amendment of the Constitution, which guarantees people, individuals, the right to a trial by jury when the amount in controversy exceeds $20. That's a constitutional right. How can you get around the fact that our framers intended for people to be able to deal with their disputes in court as opposed would, to an in... Uh, I'll just reclaim real quick. I think that's a fair question. time has expired. We call that the right of contract negotiating a contract. Expired. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from North Carolina seek recognition? Uh, Madam Chair, I move to strike the last word. The gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Forced arbitration contributes to inequities in the workplace, preventing women and minority workers from having their cases heard by a jury of their peers. We know of numerous cases of sexual harassment in the American workplace. However, far too many of these cases remain shrouded behind forced arbitration agreements, silencing women who have been sexually harassed at work. Forced arbitration prevents these women from banding together to file class action suits and allows their employers to settle confidentially without forcing perpetrators to change their behavior. This was the case with Roger Ailes at Fox News who used forced arbitration to silence Gretchen Carlson and other survivors of Ailes harassment. And Mr. Cicilline alluded to her previous testimony. This was also the case with Uber which used forced arbitration to block passengers who were sexually assaulted by drivers 
from filing a class action lawsuit. It is the case with so many other women we have yet to hear from because forced arbitration kept them silent. Our economy is strongest when women are empowered to safely and fully participate in our workforce. Forced arbitration is too often used to shield employers with histories of harassment who drive women away from their businesses and out of the workforce. I'm proud to be a sponsor of the FAIR Act, which will ensure workers, consumers, and small businesses have a choice in whether or not to use arbitration in disputes. I urge my colleagues to support the bill, and I yield back. The gentlewoman yields. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, seek recognition? The gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much to the author of this legislation and other long, long years that you have worked on this, Mr. Johnson, and thank you for your leadership, the subcommittee chair and full committee chair. Um, on as I listen to uh, the discussion, uh, I am uh, struck by the uh, lopsided uh, analysis uh, of lacking in understanding of the millions of Americans that have unknowingly clicked away their rights due to arbitration clauses buried in fine print of consumer and employment contracts. And in my brief comments, that is clearly what I want to focus on, that the arbitration or forced arbitration clauses are basically smoke and mirrors. They're mostly not known. And I believe that our justice system, as I argued in the non-consent uh, actions of the previous bill, uh, where you would give protection to third party through uh, non-consent agreements, this is the same thing. Uh, and I think the clear element of what we need to do uh, is to ensure that we have no smoke and mirrors in the justice system. Transparency is what this bill indicates. When an individual signs a contract containing a forced arbitration clause, and he or she is cheated, discriminated against, assaulted, or otherwise harmed, the corporation will force the individuals into a secret, rigged, forced arbitration system that is on their terms and in their interests. It's not in the interest of the harmed person. Corporations can choose where the arbitration will take place, what the rules will be, and how the costs will be borne. Unlike the public nature of the judicial system, the results of arbitration disputes are often kept secret lack procedural safeguards. They are intimidating. It goes back to my original uh, analysis of our earlier bill. You have the giant, uh, and unfortunately, sometimes the biblical story does not prevail. David does not prevail. David loses in this world that we live in. I wish David would win against giants like Goliath, biblically speaking, but in many instances, the intimidated individual loses his or her opportunity. The results of arbitration disputes, as I said, their talent, uh, their trait is secret, no procedural safeguards, costly, and they limit due process rights normally seen in the courtroom. For example, the arbitration protocols for the American Arbitration Association state that arbitrators of consumer disputes must maintain the privacy of the hearing to the extent permitted by the applicable law. The prevalence of arbitration clauses has doubled in scope since the 1990s and currently impacts more than 60 million workers today thanks to a slew of Supreme Court decisions surrounding forced arbitration that has eroded the worker and the consumer's right to pursue justice through a public court. Now, let me be very clear. The original goodness of arbitration uh, was uh, to ensure that we could bring down cost of litigation and we could help people uh, who wouldn't have the resources and they could get a fair shake uh, at the uh, tenets of justice. Uh, it was to help and not harm. But we have seen as they have grown, again, the lady scales of justice have heavily weighed in the favor of the rich and the powerful. These kinds of agreements are heavily prevalent in female-dominated industries. 
And according to the ACLU, 57.6% of female workers are subject to the practice, as well as in low-wage fields and industries dominated by women of color. Can you imagine walking into a room, uh, you are in a essential worker capacity, you're a meat packer. Yes, you have a union representative, maybe, and maybe you're not. Maybe you're in a grocery store. Uh, maybe you're in some other capacity, and you walk into a room, and I will assure you that there is a mountain of individuals that look more powerful, may not be uh, the same as you, and you are expected to sit through an arbitration. According to an NYU law study, employees are less likely to pursue discrimination cases in arbitration, and that when they do, they are less likely to win, and their monetary awards far lower than they would in the court. For example, according to ACU, in 30 years, only 17 women on Wall Street had won sexual harassment claims in industry arbitration before the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, Wall Street's self-governing organization. So, Mr. Chairman, this legislation is long overdue. I hope we'll have an opportunity to respond to anyone else's concerns about this legislation, but there's a long litany you. of people left along the highway of justice because of arbitration, forced arbitration. I ask my colleagues to support this legislation. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Gomert seek recognition? Does what, for what purpose does Mr. Gomert seek recognition? Strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Um, some of the sound bites that we've heard make for good rhetoric, but um, uh, for example, to say these arbitrations are at secret locations, well, if that, that's a nice rhetoric, but if they're secret locations, then the parties couldn't find it. They can't be at secret locations. They gotta be where people know where to go for arbitration. Will the gentleman yield? Sound, no, I won't. Uh, I've got a lot of points to make here, and I'm going to run out of time. No, you won't. You misinterpreted what I said. I'll yield back. And that was not your comment. I did not hear you make that comment, by the way. Well, um, then the gentleman misinterpreted what I said. Then. Well, I heard the term used, arbitration being at secret locations. So that is what it is. But um, to say we are going to decide basically as judges, that any arbitration clause that's agreed to before an, a contract is actually made uh, is forced, that sounds like a judicial decision. Um, and just for a little educational purposes, I, I was educated, I don't know if there's anybody here that's ever gone through all the uh, international arbitration training to be an international arbitrator. I've never done it, but I went through and passed uh, the three days of, of testing. But uh, what you find out when you really dig deeply is, for example, with regard to international disputes, these are often between businesses that do businesses before and after disputes arise. They may have one supplier. They don't have time to go to one country's courts where they're not going to get a fair trial, where it's going to be outrageous, where maybe judges are more political than they are judicial. And so in order to get around that, they agree in advance, okay, we're not going to do business unless you agree to arbitration because we can't afford to be tied up in your political judges' courts in your country for years and years, we can't afford that because if you're our supplier, we're gonna need your supplying even after disputes arise. So we will agree to arbitration and the best arbitration that I've observed occur and it seemed to be most fair, each side gets to pick one arbitrator and then those two arbitrators choose the presiding arbitrator and it Would creates a much more fair environment than like yield? I've observed in courtrooms as would, a litigator the gentleman yield on where the a judge turns to the plaintiff's lawyer and says, uh, is he right about that objection? No, judge, he's not right on that one either. Okay, overruled. Uh, is he right on that one? Uh, you know, judge, he may be right. Okay, sustained. Would, I've actually experienced those kind of, of, of things. And so 
Would the gentleman talk yield about for the five courts seconds is being on that issue? Fair. Let me. I've got too many points to make, and I didn't keep interrupting you guys. All right. So, if we want to say that if a claim involves sexual abuse or sexual harassment, that cannot be forced arbitration. That's something we ought to take up because that that does sound like there's been a great deal of unfairness. But to allow a party to an important contract, maybe multi-million or multi-billion dollar contract, to say, nope, that is not, uh, that's forced arbitration, and we're going to give an advantage to the one that's going to be able to go to their local court, have a lot of home cooking, and really uh, actually force the other party to into what they would never have ended the contract if they had known they were going to be forced into. So it's not like every court is the most fair. I always felt like we ought to be in pursuit of fairness all the time and root out unfair judges. But in commercial transactions, for this, for this group to say, we're not going to allow you the opportunity to contract to avoid the problems that arbitration in many business cases really provides, I think is unfair, and I don't think it's very wise, and it may be another factor that forces businesses into other countries. My time's expired, so I yield. Gentleman yields back for what purpose does Ms. McBath seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Would the gentlelady yield to me for a moment? Yes, sir. Please. Thank you. I would just point out that this bill does not prevent parties from agreeing to arbitrate a claim after the dispute arises. They can still agree to arbitrate it as long as it's after the dispute arises, and this will ensure that arbitration agreements are truly voluntary and transparent. I thank the gentlelady for yielding. The gentlelady yield for five seconds to me. Yes, I yield. Thank you. Uh, my friend from Texas uh, spoke about uh, arbitration in an international setting, applying the business to business. This uh, legislation applies to businesses and consumers and businesses and employees, not equal bargaining strength between business to business as the gentleman spoke of. And with that, I'll uh, yield back. Thank you. Um, I want to thank my good friend and fellow Georgian Congressman Johnson for bringing this really important legislation before us today. And, you know, for far too long, our workers, consumers, and small businesses and people seeking justice have discovered the harm of arbitration clauses. You know, growing up, growing up we all learned that, you know, you know, if we're harmed or if we're cheated, you know, we're going to get our day in court. We will get that chance to seek justice or to make our case or to convince a jury and to be made whole. But if an arbitration clause was buried in the fine print, this day never actually comes. And I've heard the misinformation that's spreading about this, and people say that you don't have to sign that arbitration clause if you don't want to. But when you're a parent who is trying to put food on the table, how are you supposed to go up against the big company that has offered you a job with a forced arbitration clause in it? Are you going to risk losing a job offer before you actually have it? And just in case something goes wrong down the line, I wouldn't. The reality is that these clauses have become pervasive, and it is very difficult to be a typical consumer, small business, or employee without ever signing a forced arbitration clause. Other people have said forced arbitration is actually better than a court. If it's better, then the person who was harmed would choose it. The power player on the other side of the table, maybe a company that sold a dangerous product or an employer that's trying to cover up harassment, wouldn't have to force you to go to arbitration and give up your right to choose your day in court. So I'd like my constituents to know. I want my employees, my small business owners and consumers that I represent, I want you to know this. Passing the FAIR Act is about making sure that you have a choice. It's about making sure that our courthouse doors remain open to all as a place to seek justice. Nothing in this FAIR Act will prevent you from seeking 
um, some other dispute resolution processes, including, including arbitration, if you choose that. But it's critical that no one is forced out of court before their case, their claim, or their mistreatment even arises. And I am so proud to be an original co-sponsor of the FAIR Act, joining over 200 sponsors, co-sponsors from both sides of the aisle. And again, I'd like to thank my colleague, Congressman Johnson, for his great work on this legislation and his commitment to keeping the courthouse doors open to all who want to have their uh, wrongs righted in the courthouse. I urge my colleagues to support this legislation, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Gates seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I recall when arriving in Congress, one of my Republican colleagues said, you can't possibly support these Democrat efforts to reform arbitration in America because that'll help the trial lawyers and the trial lawyers hate us. And I always thought that was a foolish reason to support or oppose any legislation, just that political allies or political adversaries happen to be on one side or the other. And so I want to have a substantive debate about why I support the FAIR Act, why I think my fellow Republicans should. But even if you apply that ridiculous standard of, well, we shouldn't be with the people that hate us, it is something to listen to my Republican colleagues carry so much water for the woke corporations that now hate us way more than the trial lawyers ever did. And so, you know, take a moment and just kind of like reflect on who these arguments are really benefiting. And I'm going to illustrate a few examples that I think are particularly telling. Uh, I also think that this election in Virginia last night is reflective of a realignment going on in politics and in policy where Republicans really have an opportunity to be pro-worker. And it's a lot of the blue collar regular folks who deserve a fair system if they had an employment dispute or any other dispute to occur in a taxpayer funded court, not in some concierge constructed judicial private sector system intended to benefit the most powerful people that can drive folks into that system. And so what I would say is get in, the water's warm, support Representative Johnson's good bill and enjoy how great it will be for workers. Look, this doesn't just arise uh, in sexual harassment cases, and that is certainly troubling. I mean, I'm deeply moved when you hear victims of sexual harassment say that their abusers got to pick the jury in advance through an arbitration system. That's crazy. But another uh, venue in which this arises frequently is wage theft. Wage theft is an awful thing that happens all over America where businesses just take money that have been earned by our fellow Americans. And oftentimes those claims don't get adequately or fairly resolved because there's mandatory arbitration in those employment contracts. And what's going to happen is that the reason they're unfair, that arbitration panel is going to see that corporation that maybe systemically engages in wage, wage theft many, many times. But they're only going to see that individual worker once. And many times they're kind of designated by the corporate construct around corporate arbitration. So it truly is the big businesses and the powerful picking their juries in advance before abusing workers financially or, or perhaps even, even worse. Um, I, would, I heard my colleague, Mr. Biggs, and I always pay close attention to his arguments because they're always very well reasoned, talk about the impact on small businesses. I've litigated before arbitration panels, and I've litigated before arbitration panels on behalf of small businesses. And you know when that arises most frequently in America? Franchise agreements. Franchise agreements that have small businesses somehow engaged in some dispute resolution, and then they are getting crushed by arbitration panels that might see that big uh, business that, engage, that, that deploys the franchises many, many, many times, but only sees that individual franchisee once. I have observed in my five years in Congress that the powerful often want their own system. They want their own system to give money, like through PACs and lobbyists. Uh, they want their own financial system and their own rules that apply to us, but wouldn't apply to just Joe Lump, Lunchbox guy on the street. And my argument in support of the FAIR Act 
is that big business should not be able to create their own legal system that they get to pre-design and pre-construct and pre-populate with jurists and, and, and not face true judgment in Article Three courts or in the local courthouse. The American taxpayers pay for a publicly funded judicial system. As Mr. Mr. Johnson deftly noted, it was so important, it was written into our constitution. So if we are constitutionalists, let's embrace the public sector system, let's improve it where it needs improvement, and let's not allow the most powerful entities to hurt the workers that are overwhelmingly going to become our Republican voters. This is a great chance to stand up for them. It's no surprise that Mr. Cicilline is able to cite data that overwhelming majorities of Americans support this legislation, and we shouldn't carry water for folks who aren't too fond of us to stand in the way of it and stand in the way of the justice that should be afforded to every American in every dispute. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, for what purpose does Ms. Garcia seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentlemen, ladies, recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for bringing this bill forward, and I want to thank again uh, Mr. Johnson uh, for working on this bill uh, so very, very hard. I'm a proud original co-sponsor of the FAIR Act because it's past time to close unjust loopholes that give employers and businesses the right to ignore civil rights and consumer protection laws and force arbitration. And I just want to go over two personal experiences that kind of underscore the force arbitration. Um, I, I went to um, a storage place to rent a storage space uh, to, to keep some uh, things that just didn't quite fit in my garage. And much to my dismay, when I went to go sign the contract, um, it was no longer on paper. It was a computerized or uh, on the computer, you know, like a tablet. And I had to go page by page to check that I agreed on parts of it, little pieces and pieces. So when it came to the one that had the arbitration clause, I said, no, I disagree. I don't want arbitration. If I have a dispute with you, I want to go to court. And the lady said to me, well, I'm sorry, ma'am, you have to fill it out because if not, you can't go on. And I said, what do you mean? So literally, they force you to agree because if you don't agree, it doesn't flip to the next page to you, for you to finish signing off on your contract and get to the final point where you sign off. And I said, ma'am, well, why don't you just bring me a copy of it and I'll just change it there because that's usually what I do on some of these things. And she said, ma'am, I can't help you. If you don't sign that, then you can't rent from us. And of course, I was even more upset because I already had moved all my stuff in there. They had told me to go ahead and move in and then come, come down to the office afterwards. And I told her, I said, well, if you're gonna do that, why don't you tell me before I moved all my stuff? I said, because now you're forcing me to sign this, although I don't want to. That is force upon force. Same thing happened with another uh, uh, retailer who handed me something in writing. And of course, as I said earlier, what I usually do is go through and exit out and initial it for a change in a contract. All those of us who are lawyers know that's what we do. But what's perplexing, what it was really outrageous about the, the, um, the uh, storage place is that you have absolutely no choice. If you don't do it, it doesn't go on to the next page. So yes, it's true. 85% of Americans across the, across the board want forced arbitration to get out of their contracts. And notably, out of 13 million consumers in conventional class actions, only about 3,605 opted out of the settlements and only a handful of those chose to file an arbitration claim. I'm a former judge. I strongly believe in the right to trial by jury. And I know know what, what, what comes with worth arbitrations. This is because arbitration in general is a private process conducted out of public view with no judge or jury. And yes, sometimes the, the, the party involved doesn't really have a choice on the arbitrator. As a member of Congress, we have a responsibility to safeguard our American judicial system by ensuring fair opportunities for all. This is not about trial lawyers. This is about consumers. It's about transparency and it's about fairness. That's why it's important for us to protect the right of, for everyday Americans to be able to choose 
for them to choose on their own and not be forced in certain consumer contracts whether to go through arbitration that has patently prevented large corporations from skirting accountability. That's why I support Mr. Johnson's um, FAIR Act. It's about fairness. And with that, I yield the remainder minute to him if he has any additional comments. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, Representative Garcia, for the time. I want to thank uh, my colleague, um, Mr. Gates from Florida, for, for being courageous enough to go against the grain and to help educate uh, all of us about the important uh, rights that we have in the Bill of Rights, the Seventh Amendment. Uh, you can't get around that. Now, someone mentioned uh, about uh, the freedom to contract, and freedom to contract uh, is not mentioned in the Bill of Rights, uh, as is the right to a jury trial in a civil case that the amount in controversy exceeds $20. But it's inherent in the Constitution that parties would be able to contract with each other uh, in a free country. Uh, we all accept that proposition, but we all should accept the fact that the framers intended for there to be a process for resolving disputes that should lie with the individual. Yeah. And that is the uh, right to a jury trial. I've run out of time uh, before I made my main point, but the point is that uh, we need to respect that constitutional right here and uh, do what our framers intended. Time. And the parties are free after the dispute arises to arbitrate, to agree to arbitration. That's the way that it should be in America. The time of the gentlelady has expired. For what purpose does Mr. Sh Shabbat seek recognition? The gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and before yielding my colleague uh, from North Carolina, uh, Mr. Bishop, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, one thing is I had the pleasure of practicing law, generally pleasure, wasn't always pleasurable, but practicing law for almost two decades uh, before coming here. Um, and uh, I've been on arbitration panels, served on arbitration panels, and had litigation, was a litigator in front of arbitration uh, panels. So they can be, you know, good or bad. In general, I think they're overall pretty good um, for a number of reasons. One thing, if you go through the civil justice system in this country in most states, and certainly at the federal level, it can take a long, long time to get your justice. And oftentimes at the civil level, these are basically about money in one form or another. It takes you a long time if, if you've suffered some damage to get that money and you're not sure if you're going to get it at, at all. And of course, the trial lawyers and the large or small law, law firms, but especially the, the large ones, uh, you know, get a pretty hefty fee. It can be hundreds or even sometimes uh, more than $1,000 per hour um, or a hefty portion of, of the judgment. Um, and in general, uh, arbitration, the purpose of it is to get your case handled more speedily. And there are various ways of handling them. As Mr. Gomert said, um, oftentimes each side picks an arbitrator and then the two arbitrators pick a third arbitrator. So you have... Um, as you know, it's not some uh, you know behind the scenes uh, uh, you know a dark setting that everybody's afraid of. And as again, as Mr. Gummer said, that nobody knows where it's at and stuff. We obviously know where it's at, and oftentimes it's at at one of the courthouses and one of the one of the rooms there. Um, but these are things in general that are to smooth a very unwieldy process and give justice. Uh, to more people uh, in, a, in a quicker manner. And that's, in general, the way uh, that they work. And I'll, at this time, yield to the, uh, Mr. Well, Bishop. Would the gentleman yield for a question? Uh, I, I've already said I'd yield to, if I have any time left, but then I'm going to Mr. Gilbert and your I'll try to I'll try to be efficient, Mr. Johnson. I, you know, as I've heard the discussion evolve, it has much more to do with go to you next. when is a contract entered into, what are the steps that are necessary, what facts might avoid the contract, uh, you know, you, it, a contract under the, first of all, it's state law. States in the United States all have contract law. It's not a general issue of the of federal government law. Agreements that are coerced or forced are not, are not uh, binding contracts. The law of every, contract law of every state has a doctrine of unconscionability under which a contract entered into might be undone 
if some one party has been abused according to the statistics pretty involved doctrine. Um, the, uh, there are, there's a notion, notion of the contracts of adhesion under which some contracts are uh, disabled, invalidated by state contract law. This is what really you're arguing about. But I got to tell you, when two parties have entered into an agreement and then a dispute arises about their agreement and one party doesn't want to abide by the contract, that's not forced. That's enforced. You're enforcing the agreement that was made. And to Mr. Gates, um, you haven't heard me shill for the big companies. In fact, I said, if you design a piece of legislation appropriately, I'm not, sta I'm not going to stand in the way. These are, these are the patrons. No, this was before you were in country. Congress, Mr. Bishop. Well, okay, but I certainly haven't said it today, nor am I taking it on because trial lawyers will benefit. They certainly will. What drives this is the economic motivations of the organized national class action trial bar. That's why this was forced through the De Democratic caucus. So, so do their, you consider no, I'm going to reclaim my time, Mr. Uh, Gates. You had your opportunity. That's why it's happening. But if you want to design a law appropriately so it just uh, lets Amazon be eaten alive by class action suits, I don't think it'd be great for economic efficiency. But what I'm concerned about is little people across the economic landscape who, who's, who this, because the trial bar doesn't care about them, and frankly, those who otherwise advocate for this bill don't give a wit about all those small fries. That's who I'm concerned about. And that's why I oppose a law so carelessly and recklessly drafted as this one. And I yield back so that you can yield to Mr. Johnson. All right. I, I don't have enough time to do any more with, so I'll just yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purposes, Ms. Jayapal seek recognition? Move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I find myself once again uh, in a place where I thank Mr. Gates for making some arguments that I would make. Um, and I think this is about the little people. That's exactly what we're trying to do here. It is about the little people. Um, the reality is that the Forced Arbitration and Justice Repeal Act, and I thank Mr. Johnson, my colleague, Representative Johnson, for introducing this and a proud co-sponsor. Uh, this is the act that restores the rights of little people, workers, consumers, small businesses, by preserving their choice to settle disputes out of court. The FAIR Act bars forced arbitration clauses which require out-of-court mediation for employment, consumer, antitrust, and civil rights disputes. With forced arbitration clauses, you are actually hurting the little people because you're stripping away the access to the courts. And that is the problem we are trying to fix. Corporations included forced arbitration clauses so that they can funnel these disputes into private systems that favor corporate interests and place people at a disadvantage. None of the rules that apply in court apply in arbitration. Corporations choose every aspect of the dispute proceeding. They choose the mediator that oversees the dispute, where they choose where the dispute proceedings will take place, and they choose the terms of the relief. In other words, corporations work against the little people. They create an environment that is entirely in their favor, making it more difficult for workers or consumers to prove their case. Forced arbitration also shields corporations from public accountability. This secretive, confidential nature of the proceedings means that there is no public review of complaints or of final decisions. And so the public is unaware whether a dispute was settled fairly and the company in question escapes the culpability for their actions. Now, I want to specifically draw attention to the issue of sexual harassment and forced arbitration, which we have previously discussed in this committee. In July, I and several of my colleagues introduced the bipartisan bicameral legislation, H.R. 4445, the Ending Forced Arbitration of Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment Act. And much like the FAIR Act, this bill invalidates forced arbitration clauses that prevent sexual assault and sexual harassment survivors from seeking justice and public accountability under the laws meant to protect them. Industries that employ and serve large numbers of women are much more likely to have forced arbitration requirements. For example, numerous women have claimed that they were sexually assaulted by Uber drivers. However, they failed to file a class action lawsuit due to a forced arbitration clause that was listed in the Uber terms and conditions. While Uber later publicly announced that the company was not forcing victims into arbitration for sexual assault and battery, Uber's lawyers were still filing motions to compel arbitration for all remaining claims in the lawsuit, stripping them of their right to have their disputes heard in court. 
So women are losing and have been put have been losing in forced arbitrations proceedings. So put simply, this is a rigged system and it's rigged against the little people. Legislation that bans forced arbitration agreements is an important structural step towards eliminating, in the case of sexual assault, eliminating institutional protection for harassers and finally ending the culture of sexism that continues to happen across America, from corporate boardrooms to the halls of power. But that can be applied across the board with arbitration, forced arbitration agreements. And that's why I'm so proud that we're marking up this bill. This would restore choice and allow corporations to be held publicly accountable for their actions so that we can make sure that at the end of the day, instead of protecting the powerful and their profits, we need to protect, we can protect workers, consumers, and the little people. Thank you so much. Would, the gentle, lady, would the gentle lady yield? I yield to uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. The framers of the Constitution intended to protect the little people. They protected individual rights with the Bill of Rights, amendments one through 10 of the Constitution. I'd like to know from any of my colleagues on the other side, how do you uh, explain the Seventh Amendment, which, uh, which is in the Constitution, and I'm assuming that everyone has read it, how do you explain away the right that the framers gave to the little people to process their claims in excess of $20 before a trial by jury. How do you explain that? Does anybody, can I yield to anybody to explain that, the Seventh Amendment? The, the silence is deafening. I mean, we have a right guaranteed to the people, and my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, with the exception of at least Mr. Gates, uh, want to ignore that right, uh, to make it somehow go away. Why? Because you're trying to protect the big guy, the corporations. The time the of the uh, gentlelady has expired. The gentleman, you mean? No, the gentlelady. The gentlelady, it was my, my time and I yielded and I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does Mr. McClintock seek recognition? Uh, to speak on the amendment. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Uh, first, to take a stab at Mr. Johnson's question, uh, the framers also recognized the freedom of contract and the freedom of two individuals to agree to terms that are mutually agreeable to them. Where is that Under, in the no, Bill of Rights? Let me, let me finish. Under current law, uh, as I understand it, um, if a contract has an arbitration clause, a dispute has to go to arbitration unless both sides later agree to go to court. This law reverses that option and says that a dispute has to go to trial unless both sides later agree to go to arbitration. Now, what, what troubles me as a, as a consumer is that I may want a guarantee that a dispute will go to arbitration. I can't afford a lawyer. That, the arbitration protects me as a little guy against a company that's got a great big legal department. Um, so, that's an important protection for me. This bill denies me the, the guarantee of that protection and hands the decision to the company with which I have the dispute. Now, after a dispute arises, one party or the other is going to have an advantage to go to court. And what this does is to allow one party to deny to the other that choice of going to arbitration. I mean, why would a big company agree before a dispute that, uh, for an arbitration clause? I think it's pretty obvious they're protecting themselves from frivolous lawsuits that organized groups might, might bring. But at the same time, I may, as a consumer or an employee, want the protection of arbitration because, as I said, I can't afford a lawyer to go to trial and take on the company's entire legal department. So, so this is a mutual benefit for both of us to agree to in advance. But if that option is no longer available to me, um, after a specific dispute arises, uh, that company is going to have a huge incentive to force it to go to trial because they can bear the costs and I can't. And, and that's where we come to this whole concept of, uh, of forced arbitration, which I, I don't think is an accurate way to phrase it. In a free market, both parties have to agree to terms that they find mutually agreeable. 
unless a, a, a gun is being used in, the, uh, in, in that transaction, uh, both sides have an absolute protection against an agreement that works against their interests. It's the word no. Neither party is forced into an agreement. There's an absolute protection in that word no. No, the terms are not agreeable to me. If you want to insist on this particular term, I'm going to need more money uh, as an employee. I'm going to need a lower cost as a, as a consumer. Those things are voluntarily negotiated. We, we heard earlier of the case of, um, of an individual who uh, uh, wants a rental agreement and the company wants an arbitration a clause. That's a, that, both the consumer and the, um, of, of, uh, the company are going to, to look at the totality of the terms and decide whether that totality is agreeable to them. If both sides find an advantage in the totality of those terms, they, they agree to the contract. If one side or the other doesn't feel it's advantageous to them, no contract occurs. That's the, the freedom of the marketplace. And in fact, this is, bill is what is applying force to that transaction. It forces both parties into an agreement without the protection of arbitration. This denies the parties to the contract the choice of agreeing to arbitration. Uh, so, would the gentleman you your question? No, I think I'm I'm done at this point. Does the gentleman yield back? The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does Ms. Dean seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. General lady's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of the Forced Arbitration Injustice Repeal Act, authored by my friend and colleague, Mr. Johnson. And I do so proudly as a former Philadelphia trial lawyer. Lawyers who do not hate, trial lawyers seek justice, compassion, and remedies for those who suffer negligence and serious injury. And yet we know this legislation is not about trial lawyers. It's about consumers and employees, those who suffer harm and seek justice. Most Americans may not notice the rapid increase in arbitration clauses in the fine print of terms of agreements or contracts, but its use continues to grow without much regulation. In fact, it has doubled in scope between the 1990s and currently. Now it impacts more than 60 million workers. Forced arbitration is being written into all types of contracts, including those used for home building, insurance, car leases, credit cards, retirement accounts, investment accounts, nursing homes, just to list a few. Arbitration policies are also tacked on to onboarding paperwork for many different kinds of employment, white collar and blue collar jobs alike. This is of particular importance to women. As the co-chair of the Bipartisan Women's Caucus, I believe it is important to highlight the power differentials that still exist for women in the workplace. This is only exacerbated through forced arbitration. Forced arbitration prohibits workers from suing an employer, even if they experience sexual harassment on the job. If an employee does, not, does bring a lawsuit against his or her employer for sexual harassment, they don't get a public hearing or their day in court. Instead, companies will hire a private arbitrator to resolve the allegation, and the, the plaintiffs are therefore barred from lawsuits. These policies are often put in place to benefit the employer. Studies have shown that companies are more likely to win in arbitration than they are if a case is taken to state or federal court. Arbitrators are typically not required to explain how they came to their final decision in a written document, and these decisions are nearly impossible to appeal. The FAIR Act would allow workers, consumers, and Americans in general to choose how they want to pursue their dispute once one should arise. I thank my colleague, Mr. Johnson, for addressing this issue that we voted for in the last Congress, and I ask my colleagues to support it again. With that, I yield back. Will, will the gentlelady yield? I will yield to the gentleman. I thank, I thank the gentlelady for yielding. I just wanted to illustrate one example. Disney uses arbitration, and they use someone's acceptance of a ticket as a basis to enter into that arbitration. So while I wish all these negotiations were as high-minded 
and thoughtful as uh, my colleague from California, Mr. McClintock stated, do you really think that when your Joe and Jill lunchbox constituents save up all year, they go down to Disney, what if one of Disney's rides hurts them, hurts their kids, hurts their family members? They would typically think they would get their day in court, right? But oftentimes they don't because Disney says, well, because you bought a ticket to our theme park, you have agreed to arbitration. And when court said, well, that's okay, that's not a contract of adhesion for adults, but adults can't waive that right for minors, Disney hired lobbyists and tried to get the laws changed in Florida so that a parent could waive a child's right to a day in court if that child is injured on a ride or otherwise. And it's just ludicrous to me that these are even upheld. And it I shows that these docs, uh, yeah, you'll back. I thank the gentleman for that powerful example and the example of how uh, the negotiating power is not equal in these in such contracts. And I yield the balance of my time to Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Uh, my colleague, uh, Representative Garcia, talked about moving and going to a storage facility. Any storage facility that you go to is going to have a arbitration clause in the agreement that you're going to have to sign. So if you want to use a storage facility, if you want to get the, the truck the rental truck to move your your property to the moving facility, all of those uh, moving companies, uh, you know, have the arbitration clause in the agreement. So the ability to negotiate is not there. It's a take it or leave it situation, and that's what causes the forced arbitration part of this. That's what we mean by forced arbitration. And with that. I yield back. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. General Lady yields back. For what purposes does Mr. Benz seek recognition? I'll strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you. The, there's several assumptions in this, in this debate that are of interest to me. I, I also uh, practiced law for many years, also served as an arbitrator, also drafted innumerable arbitration provisions, also discussed uh, so many uh, choices between uh, clients of, of having access to the courts or to go through arbitration. It's just a very familiar space. And I, I want to join um, um, Mr. Gomert in his remarks about the fact that there are certain arbitration, uses of arbitration agreements that need to be addressed. What is unfortunate about this bill is that it indeed uh, is the meat act approach, and that is really sad because it's it's uh, terrifically important that uh, that we address these issues. But the, the confusing the contracts of adhesion, which we've heard about a lot, with negotiated agreements that this uh, this uh, bill would prevent and and also uh, wipe out is simply uh, not appropriate. Shouldn't be done. And, and I have an amendment that I'll be addressing later, Mr. Chair, in that regard. The, the other the other assumption that is really sad for those of us who practice law and eventually left the law practice to be in space just like this to try to make a, a, a difference, is, that, is, the, is the thought that somehow everyone's going to run into court. I cannot count the number of people who came to my office and, and ask for me to sue somebody. And I would say, yeah, how much money you got? Do you, do you, can you write a check out for all the costs? So you got those depositions, you got that motion practice. So this blith assumption that somehow by passing this bill and suddenly the gates to justice will open, Please, the, the, the challenge here is uh, what is the remedy that you actually are providing for folks uh, when you pass this bill? Because if the remedy is that everyone's going to be able to go to court, that's simply incorrect. Look at the number of cases that are not being filed right now, both in federal and in circuit court, in, in state court. It's, it's plummeting. Some might blame arbitration clauses. Others might say we figured out better ways of trying to solve these problems because it is extraordinarily expensive to go to court. And so to, have, to suggest that people are somehow going to be made better about this, I, I just suggest to you go practice in a small town for 40 years, as I did. The, the, the last thing I want to mention is, um, is the, uh, the, the, the fact that this bill could be dramatically improved if it did just address contracts of adhesion. Uh, and and the, the thought that somehow when the... Um, the argument, the fight comes up. Suddenly you're gonna sit down and agree to arbitration. What a joke. What ends up happening is the folks come in and say, hey, we've got a problem. 
And then if you, if you are the one in the better bargaining position, the last thing you're going to do uh, is agree to this. We heard this earlier, but this, there seems to be a, a belief that somehow this is going to work better. I would simply suggest this bill needs a lot of work. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield to uh, Judge, uh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Comer. Well, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, and I appreciate the reference to uh, uh, comments about their examples when arbitration is very helpful. And I was it did start out talking about international arbitration, but and it didn't relate the fact that those advantages apply to local and even consumer arbitration. There have been times that I was upset. And I wish there had been an arbitration provision because I would have filed a claim there, but I didn't have time, uh, you know, even to file as an attorney for myself to go through and have a lawsuit, a potential appeal, and all that kind of thing. So it, arbitration can help. But I've seen there are, as my friends across the aisle have pointed out, there are some uh, unfairnesses that have occurred. And... But the comment was helping the little guys, just as been commented, the little guys a lot of times cannot afford to, to uh, go file a lawsuit it, where it's not a class action lawsuit where you don't have to pay a dime and arbitration can be helpful where there gets, I've seen great unfairness is where like for example, a big business or an insurance company have an arbitration firm on retainer or, or they pay them, they're ongoing contractual arbitrators. And that arbitrator knows that if he makes or she makes decisions that make the company retaining them every week mad, they're not gonna use them anymore. And so they have an actual financial interest in hurting the little guy in those cases. And those are some things that should be addressed rather than just banning them completely the, uh, from even being agreed to. So, oh, see, time's expired. Thank the gentleman's, you. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does Ms. Scanlon seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you. I'm pleased to join my colleagues in marking up the FAIR Act and look forward to ending forced arbitration, which by its nature subjects consumers and employees to one-sided and burdensome contracts, contracts that in legal terms are rightly disfavored as contracts of adhesion. That is a take it or leave it contract where one party can't negotiate the terms. Everyone in this room and most people across America have been subjected to forced arbitration clauses, often without even knowing it because the clauses are buried in fine print. These forced arbitration clauses usually take away your right to go to court or file a class action, which often is the only practical way to get relief from a big corporation. Collective action, including class actions, is often the only way to get a powerful business to change abusive practices. As law students did several years ago when they organized to oppose the use of forced arbitration clauses in employment contracts by the country's largest law firms. Think about it. In, 20, in a 2015 study, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau found that 53% of credit card issuers 88% of mobile wireless providers and 99% of payday lenders utilize forced arbitration in their contracts with consumers. In practical terms, when you apply for a credit card or buy a cell phone, you don't get to negotiate the terms of use. If you tried to tell the bank or the cell phone provider that you'd like a different deal, you'd be laughed out of the bank or cell phone store. That's a take it or leave it contract. And despite the attempts to justify the use of forced arbitration by big businesses, corporations don't require these clauses out of the goodness of, goodness of their corporate hearts. They do it because it saves a corporation money when consumers or employees can't enforce their rights or get accountability through the courts. Credit card issuers, cell phone providers, payday lenders, and other markets are dominated by unfair contracting terms that limit real accountability when something goes awry. In a world built upon mobile phones and credit, this means that giving up one's fundamental right to trial by jury is all but necessary to live or work. I'm particularly appalled by the use of forced arbitration agreements in private student loan contracts. That same CP CFPB study found that 86% of the largest student lenders in the private student loan market 
employ the use of pre-dispute arbitration clauses in their contracting. As it stands, American borrowers bear over $1.7 trillion in student loan debt. In the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, more student borrowers shoulder higher amounts of student debt, an average of $36,000 per borrower, than most of the country. And that student borrower debt is continuing to rise. When banks imposed forced arbitration on student loans, the inequities of our underfunded educational systems are compounded. And we're left with a system in which students are forced to decide between waiving their rights or getting the money they need to finance a degree. Under the Obama administration, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau issued a set of rules banning the use of for forced arbitration in student loan contracts. However, the last administration and Republicans in Congress repealed those protections in 2017. That's why earlier this year I reintroduced the Justice for Student Borrowers Act, which would codify the ban on pre-dispute arbitration clauses and pre-dispute joint action waivers in private student loans. We have a lot of work to do to make sure that higher education is affordable and accessible for all. But eliminating unfair lending practices that compound the student debt crisis must be part of that effort. I urge my colleagues to support the FAIR Act and vote this bill favorably out of committee. Would the gentlelady and with that, yield? I yield back. Would the gentlelady yield to me behind you? I'm sorry, Mr. Johnson. I couldn't see where that was coming from. Mr. Issa was staring intently. Um, yes. Thank you. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, two things. One, uh, the FAIR Act would ban the enforcement of pre-dispute resolution clauses in consumer and employment agreements. Uh, but it would not ban the ability of the consumer to agree to arbitration if there is a arbitration clause in the agreement and the consumer decided that they wanted to uh, use arbitration. That's an important distinction. Uh, number two, uh, this issue of contracts of adhesion. Uh, we've heard this, that state courts should have the ability or litigants should have the ability to uh, take a matter to state court on grounds that the contract is a contract of adhesion. But the Supreme Court has ruled, unfortunately, that these contracts of adhesion, which include forced arbitration clauses are enforceable and are constitutional are, and are in keeping with our statute, uh, the Arbitration Act that was passed back in the 20s that was meant to apply only to businesses of equal bargaining strength. And so the FAIR Act will actually level the playing field for consumers and workers. And with that, I yield back. General, the general lady yields back. Uh, for what purposes, Mr. Issa seek recognition? I move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. I was uh, paying keen attention to the gentlelady's comments uh, and the goals of the majority. And I'm going to push back today, no surprise, on the goals of the majority as overreaching. I think uh, uh, as we, we've seen the last nine months of... Uh, of democratic dominance, what we've seen is an overreach. Could there be a uh, common ground on uh, the arrangements that lead to a, a decision uh, to enter binding arbitration? Absolutely. Could we have better, uh, fairer, uh, more transparent notification that one is clicking on something and it causes them to agree to binding arbitration? Absolutely. Uh, could we uh, protect the minority members of a union who find themselves, at least in this legislation, if they're in a company, they uh, vote against the union, but a union's formed, and that union negotiates binding arbitration? Guess what? They're stuck with it. They're dragged along even though they said no. Could we give some rights to the minority to not be part of uh, binding arbitration negotiated in collective bargaining, at least in open states? Sure, we could, but we're not going to do that. I believe that we should have an open and frank and candid bipartisan discussion on greater transparency uh, as to when somebody's entering it. And I do believe that if there is uh, any kind of a trust or conspiracy or activity that leads to everyone in a particular industry having 
uh, forced arbitration when in fact there should be at least one company that says, oh, fine, I'll, uh, uh, I'll go ahead and take the unlimited risk of being sued in a class action suit over something and, and take the cost of defense. But if we find that individual, I'd like to call them in and I'd like to ask, why would you make a business decision to increase the cost of doing business, make yourself have to charge more and be less competitive when in fact you would be to your detriment? And I'll, I'll go to the pharmaceutical industry. In other countries where they have no unlimited liability, pharmaceutical products, the same ones, cost less. Why do they cost less? Because the risk is definable uh, in a more finite way and not unlimited. So hopefully we could have this discussion, but let's discuss the benefit. Let's discuss whether it leads to windfall profits or in fact it leads to a lessening, lessening of the liability that ultimately reduces the cost. Having said that, I don't expect to have that discussion right now, but if uh, the majority changes, I would welcome the, minor the new minority having a real discussion with us about whether or not we could create greater transparency, greater recognition of what somebody is entering into, uh, because I think that's worthwhile. I certainly think there are people, and I'm going to close with this, I think there are people who click on uh, the I'll agree to binding arbitration and have no idea they're doing it. And that shouldn't be the case. They should understand that there is a, a trade-off in their business relationship and they should be given informed consent. Lastly, I would look forward to working with the uh, now majority on eliminating any possibility that these agreements lead to the failure to have visibility of wrongful conduct, whether it's uh, uh, by an employer or by a fellow employee. Many of the things that we saw in the hearing would make me believe that there really is a case to bar non-disclosure agreements or, or, if you will, gag orders that are overly broad or predetermined. They shouldn't be. No one should be able to say, oh yes, we're gonna settle something in arbitration and under no circumstances do we want other employees to know that there has been wrongdoing. So I do think there's a lot of opportunity. I don't currently see it in this bill. I don't see it likely to happen by accepting any of our amendments. Having said that, I look forward to the opportunity in the future if this bill does not become law. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Raskin seek recognition? Um, move straight to the last word, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized. I rise in strong support of the Forced Arbitration Injustice Repeal Act of 2021. I want to salute our colleague, Mr. Johnson, for his uh, steadfast and creative leadership for this legislation, which is of the utmost importance to uh, consumers and workers across the land. Uh, the vast majority of Americans are bound by forced arbitration right now because tucked into the tiny fine print of so many contracts are these forced arbitration clauses that essentially strip citizens of their constitutional right to a jury, a right that our framers considered sacred and central to citizenship in a democracy. These contracts include credit card contracts, bank accounts, rental car agreements, nursing home contracts, employment contracts governing somewhere between 60 and 70 million workers, the vast majority of workplaces, small business franchise agreements, cell phone agreements, cable TV, you name it, all of them affected. And we know, of course, why the large corporations want to force everyone into arbitration. Um, but it is not in the interest of the, of the vast majority of the American people. In arbitration, people have no judge, no jury, and no right to appeal. Arbitrators do not follow legal precedent and there's no public review of their decisions um, to make sure that they are consistent with the rule of law. Um, the rules of evidence, of course, are dramatically different. You don't have access to the evidence that's being um, submitted by an opposing party in many cases. These mandatory arbitration provisions um, mean that people cannot sue in court for defective products, for outright scams, 
for recklessness or negligence. In these coercive mass adhesion contracts, corporations, which are chartered creatures of the state, essentially set up a carefully controlled and choreographed system of private justice that practically nullifies the constitutional rights of the people. The Seventh Amendment, as Mr. Johnson has emphasized, states that the right of trial by jury shall be preserved. The right of trial by jury shall be preserved. And that's what we're doing with the FAIR Act. And why shall it be preserved? Well, the purpose of the Seventh Amendment is to maintain decision-making power in specific cases in the hands of the people, not an unknown, unelected, unaccountable, uh, forced arbitrator, a privately paid judge who is reporting to who knows who. Um, the Brits had denied the American colonists their jury trial rights to set up uh, instead a separate system of justice governing the colonists with no jury at all. And if you read the Declaration of Independence and Thomas Jefferson's Bill of Particulars, you will find that one of the uh, complaints against King George was that he has denied um, to us, in many cases, the benefits of trial by jury. So if we wouldn't allow kings and queens and monarchs to do it, why would we allow our own corporations that we charter to do that to the American people? So, I, and I would just like to uh, ask Mr. Johnson a couple of questions if I could, uh, as the author of this legislation, um, given that uh, the vast majority of the American people don't like forced arbitration, um, what, why do you think we're having a tough time passing this, given that anybody who wants to enter into uh, arbitration can do so after a conflict arises? Well, thank you for the question. It's clear that uh, my friends on the other side of the aisle feel, feel more deeply about preserving and protecting the rights of the wealthy, the corporations, the employers. Will the gentleman yield? Over the, uh, will the gentleman uh, yield? consumers no, no, and employees. Uh, well, then I would ask that the this, words be uh, taken uh, down. That's not right. The okay. gentleman. Uh, it's Mr. Raskin's time. It Thank doesn't you. give the right to slander other members of Congress. Mr. Raskin's Mr. Johnson, time, and he didn't slander anybody, Mr. Raskin. Mr. Thank Johnson. you, and thank you for restoring my time. Um, but we've been invited to believe that um, the FAIR Act might actually violate the rights of consumers and people renting apartments and renting uh, cars because they will want to enter into one of these uh, uh, coerced arbitration uh, clauses uh, and they will be denied the right to do so. Do you know of any case in the country where that has happened and anyone has sued because they've been denied the right to enter into a forced arbitration clause with a large corporation? Mr. Johnson. I know of no such instance. And, well, and well, Mr. Raskin, you'll Chairman, I would just ask whether any member of the committee knows of any case like that. This is Mr. Gates. Uh, if, there's, of course, no... There's, a no, there's no such circumstance because it is ridiculous. But, Mr. Raskin, if you would yield for a question. I mean, the, gentleman, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, does anyone else seek recognition? For what purpose does Mr. Johnson seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would yield to Mr. Gomer. Thank you. Uh, when we have members of this committee accuse the other members who oppose a position or oppose a wide affecting bill because it is too wide, and we're accused of taking a position purely to help big corporations. Yes, it's slanderous, and uh, I know the chairman made his ruling. I just wish I had the right to arbitrate such an unfair decision by the chairman, but uh, apparently, we it want to end any ability to do such a thing. So I've been slandered enough. I'm not yielding to somebody else to add to it. But with re there are grave unfairnesses about some arbitrations. And I've made that point. Yes, uh, we ought to help clean these things up, but not eliminate the chance of the little guy supposedly the other side is wanting to help the little guy. That's what we've heard over and over. I'd like to help the little guy. 
it would have helped me before I got to Congress to be able to file an arbitration claim instead of being left to either go hire an attorney or do it myself and take all that extra time because I know if I'd filed an arbitration claim, then we would have had one hearing, it wouldn't have taken that long, and I would have had a shot at justice so long as the arbitrator wasn't in the pocket of the party that uh, included arbitration in the agreement. So those are things we could really make a difference, and those are things that are unfair and have led to unfairness. When there is a financial, a pecuniary interest of the arbitrator in helping this company. But to eliminate all arbitration isn't just helping the little guy. You're hurting many little guys who would have filed arbitration claims uh, where they wouldn't have to hire an attorney. We just need to clean up and make sure that we have uh, fair arbitrators. And the, the constant references to the Seventh Amendment, let, let, I, I know we have people that think they know what the Constitution says, but the Seventh Amendment says, in suits at common law where the value controversy shall exceed $20, the right to trial by jury shall be preserved. And no fact tried by a jury shall otherwise be reexamined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. So, see, if, if you actually read it and don't go by your recollection of what you thought it said years ago, it says in suits at common law. If you file a lawsuit, the Seventh Amendment gives you the right to say, I want a trial by jury. I don't want to go and have this judge be the finder of fact. I want a jury to make this decision. And the Seventh Amendment should be protected by everybody on this committee because it's a great amendment. If you're going to file a lawsuit and you want to have a jury and it's more than $20 in controversy, you have that right. And there is nothing about an arbitration clause that I'm aware of that prevents anybody has the right to file a lawsuit from getting a trial by jury. That's this assures what... a right to trial by jury if you file a lawsuit. But it doesn't prohibit having arbitration that are agreed to by the party. And I appreciate uh, Mr. Gates pointing out there are very unfair uh, provisions that are considered to be contractual, where you're issued a ticket and therefore roped into a mandatory arbitration, well, that's not an arm's length agreement. And most of the time, people aren't even aware that's on there. That is not an agreement to arbitrate, and it ought to be thrown out. Uh, and we could do something to help along those lines. Now, I'm not going to compound things by accusing anybody on the other side on this issue by being in the pocket of woke plaintiff's lawyers, uh, I'm not going to repeat the kind of slander that's already occurred. Judge Gomer, Judge Gomer, will you yield yes, back my I time? Back. Well, in yield two back. seconds, I'll just I say I back. agree with you. This one goes too far. I'm done. I yield back. Gentlemen, Chairman, I have a unanimous gentlemen, gentlemen yields back for the purpose. Well, Mr. Cicilline is recognized for the purpose of a unanimous consent request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent that a letter for, be entered into the record from a broad coalition of labor, civil rights, and consumer protection organizations in support of the FAIR Act, a letter from George Slover and Saeed Ijaz from the Consumer Reports in support of the FAIR Act, a story in the Washington Post published today titled, Mandatory Arbitration Cases Have Soared During the Pandemic, a report from the American Association for Justice entitled, Forced Arbitration in a Pandemic, Corporations Double Down, and a letter from Rankin Brooks with the Alliance for Justice in support of the FAIR Act. Without objection, does anyone else seek recognition? Mr. Ben, Mr. What purpose does Mr. Ben seek? Wasn't he recognized? Uh, yes. Uh, what purpose does Mr. Ben seek recognition? Uh, I have an amendment at the, desk, at the desk, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will report the amendment. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Point of order is reserved. 
Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 963 offered by Mr. Benz of Oregon. Page 9, beginning on line 1, strike, dispute, or claim. Amendment is considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This um, amendment would strike, strike the ret retroactivity portion of the bill. It's simply wrong for Congress to step in and invalidate parts of existing contracts. This bill, if it becomes law, will have the effect of rewriting millions upon millions of existing, many times hotly negotiated contracts, not just contracts of adhesion, leading to waves of new litigation. This litigation will place new costs on businesses, consumers, and employees who may be forced to pay more for lawyers and get stuck in lengthy court battles instead of going through arbitration, which of course, for those of us who have practiced for quite a while, uh, recall, was introduced years ago as a device to try to avoid the incredible expense and delay and unpredictability of going to court. Applying new laws retroactively to contracts undermines the rule of law and it prevents the contracting parties from having certainty about their contract. This amendment would make it so that this bill applies only to agreements entered into after the bill goes into effect. By making this bill apply only to agreements prospectively, we can avoid the inherent unfairness of having Congress directly interfere in existing agreements. With that, I hope all of you will support this amendment. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I recognize myself in opposition to the amendment. Oh, does the gentleman insist on his point of order? I do not, Mr. Chairman. Point of order is withdrawn. I recognize myself in opposition to the amendment. This amendment would strike, would do exactly what the gentleman says. It would strike the re retroactivity of the bill, and that's exactly the point that it shouldn't do. There are millions of contract of uh, arbitration clauses in force now, arbitration clauses that were entered into without any real choice on the part of the, uh, of, 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 of the consumer. Um, as, as has been explained throughout this entire discussion today, uh, you can't buy an airline ticket without having, whether you know it or not, a, uh, an arbitration clause in there. You can't uh, 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 do just about anything without having a, 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 an arbitration clause that you know nothing about and that, frankly, if you try to object to, you won't be able to because they'll say take it or leave it. So the whole point of the bill is to invalidate all those arbitration agreements. Now, you can still, because the point of the 1920s law was that arbitration should occur between businesses on an equal footing when they agree to it knowingly. A series of very bad Supreme Court decisions over the last century has expanded that so that you don't have to know about it and so that you're forced into it. Um, the purpose of the bill is to get rid of that and to go back to the original intention. And that's why the bill provides that all this uh, uh, applies to pre-dispute arbitration. And if you, you have a dispute, if two companies have a dispute or a company and an individual has a dispute and choose to go into arbitration, they can still do it. But no pre-existing no pre clauses and uh, this amendment would destroy the entire purpose of the bill, which has been ample, which I just explained, and which has been amply explained in this discussion. Therefore I, I, therefore, I urge all my colleagues to vote against it, and I yield back. What? For what pur purpose does Mr. Bates seek recognition? Uh, Biggs, I'm sorry. For what purpose does Mr. Biggs seek recognition? <laughs> move, to, move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think Mr. Gomert's made a great point with regard to the, the, this, the problems that we do have in this area. And I don't think any of us haven't recognized that on this side. The problem about this bill is it is this bill that is the problem. I'm thinking about in my district, and, and I had this little colloquy with Mr. Johnson, his bill sponsor earlier. I'm thinking of the lady in my district who has a small general contracting business, builds houses one off at a time, and enters into agreements and contracts with subcontractors. And the bill sponsor himself said, if they entered into an arbitration agreement pre-dispute, it would be unenforceable under this law. 
how in the world does that help that, that lady who is the small business person in my district or even the subs who, right, right now in where I live, the competition is fierce. And so it, it, it is a negotiated pre-dispute arbitration agreement. And you're basically saying, we don't care. We're gonna lump it in the same category as T-Mobile or any, anybody else who's got a contract of adhesion that has these forced clauses. I get it, those are bad, I'm fine with that. Let's find some way to deal with that. But let's not find a way to crush the small businesswoman in my district with and the, others. Would the gentleman you would the gentleman yield for a question? Not yet, not yet. I would also say this, if this is such a great deal, if this is so imperative, why are you excluding collective bargaining agreements? You're, you're excluding them. We're gonna get everybody else, unless you're a union worker. And then, by golly, you're gonna be stuck with arbitration because that's what somebody's negotiated for you in an odd contract of adhesion that unions become. Then you can't explain on page four how a prospective work relationship, if it's prospective, how is there an agreement? How, how, is that, how does that fall into this thing? It's inexplicable. This bill is not the vehicle to right the wrongs that you think are out there, and that I agree, there are a lot of wrongs out there with regard to forced arbitration agreements. That is a problem. This bill doesn't address or resolve any of the issues I've just raised, and it's uh, unfortunate, and, and I'll, I'll yield to the gentleman from North Carolina for a second. Uh, I, I thank the gentleman from Arizona for bringing something else to mind. So construction arbitration, the contract disputes that arise in the construction of buildings, both residential and commercial, is an entire huge area of practice of law. I practiced with people who did it, didn't do it myself. I would suggest, and it's, I'm, you know, it's a bit of a guess, but based on my experience, that most construction disputes of significance involving big scale uh, projects are resolved through construction arbitration. And it gives an opportunity to illustrate one thing about arbitration that is superior to court. When, an, when a, a, a subject matter of dispute is highly technical and, uh, and there's more than one or two experts can cover to help a jury understand, but it requires a whole level of expertise, Arbitration is far would superior. Would the gentleman yield? I, not at this moment, at this moment, because I want to finish making this point. Now, I, I understand that uh, that the service contract that would be prohibited from ar arbitration prohib provisions would be barred here. Only is one involving an individual. But consider that if you have a construction contract, it's very large in scale, multiple contractor, contractors, subcontractors, third, uh, first, second, third tier subcontractors. And at the lower tier, you're talking about individuals who are working in a specific area, a tradesman, for example. That does happen rel relatively often. Well, what would happen here is, because arbitration couldn't be enforced against that lowest tier individual contractor, you would have those disputes that would be outstanding and couldn't be resolved as part of an overall resolution of a construction arbitration. It would be almost an unimaginable obstacle to resolving those questions. And with that, I yield back to the gentleman from Arizona. Mr. Chairman, I think you were asking if I'd yield. Yes. Yeah, I'll yield to you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. I'd simply observe that uh, under the terms of the bill, in, a, in the instance of a dispute between uh, 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 two contractors, um, they would go to court unless they agreed to arbitration. If they agreed to arbitration, they could have it. But they wouldn't be bound by any pre-existing uh, uh, um, um, agreement. And now the gentleman's time has expired. Okay. His time has expired. <laughs> For what purpose does Mr. Johnson of Georgia seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is uh, recognized. I rise in opposition to the uh, amendment. Uh, the FAIR Act is not retroactive. It applies to cases filed on or after the date of the enactment, and it does not apply to cases already filed or concluded. Thus, it is not actually retroactive. Republicans argue that it is retroactive because it applies to millions of forced arbitration clauses currently in existence. 
but the effective date of this bill does nothing more than tell companies with forced arbitration clauses currently in effect that should they violate the law and have a case filed against them, they cannot use a forced arbitration clause against the consumer or worker. This is no different than allowing companies to change their terms of service. Credit card companies, internet platforms, and cell phone companies routinely send customers flyers updating them as, as to changes in their products and the terms of service, and yet the minority never complains about that retroactivity when it's companies that change the terms of an agreement, but when the change is made for the advancement of consumers and workers' interest, and they falsely argue that the bill is retroactive. And so for that reason, I'm opposed to the amendment. But uh, with respect to Mr. Biggs and his uh, example of the little lady dealing with the subcontractor, and then there is a forced arbitration clause in the agreement between the subcontractor and the little lady, Yes, the subcontractor would be uh, barred from enforcing that provision against the little old lady, but the little old lady could decide that she would accept the terms of the, uh, of the agreement and uh, take her dispute with the subcontractor to arbitration. That right is preserved under uh, this uh, legislation, and with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? I do. Bishop. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So to finish the point being made a moment ago, the chairman responded at the end there that, uh, that the subcontractor that I, or the maybe second or third tier subcontractor, the individual, the mason or the framing guy or painter, uh, who <coughs> would be bound to join a construction arbitration would be would be freed. Every the, the higher tiers in this complex project would be required, or it could could be you know their agreements among each other to arbitrate their dispute could be um, enforced. But but the lower tiers would be freed of that. So what do you think would happen in the instance where that individual is freed, and you have an enormously complex dispute, the resolution of which requires the resolution of their claims. It, they, would, they would demand more than they should get because they, have, they can hold the entire scope of the construction project hostage because of their right that you would be providing them, eliminating any possibility of including them in an arbitration. It just... It, it, it sort of makes the mind, it, bog, it boggles the mind the, the, the damage that could be done. And we're just thinking of examples as we have this debate. To the point of Mr. Bence's amendment, it's just another aspect in which the wreckage to be done here is by virtue of having something that's not a, a rifle shot but a shotgun blast, uh, how much harm you could do. If you want to take the situation of massive enterprises that engage in, on a routine, routine basis, contracts of adhesion that are enforced under the law of California or something like that. You want to make the thing, you want to reshape arbitration law so that those, those injustices are corrected. Do not destroy the court systems in the federal government and the state governments across the land. Uh, eliminate this useful tool in all of the places where it is successful and, and used in constant commerce, that, that's the wrong way to go. And to the point specifically of Mr. Bence's argument about retroactivity, it would be one thing to set to change the rules going forward so that parties in our economy could adjust their plans. For example, if you can't have arbitration agreements and lots of uh, uh, individual consumer interactions and, and purchases that are very low dollar uh, transactions, but might but will entail a risk of tens of thousands of dollars of litigation costs in each case, then businesses will stop serving those segments of the market because the cost will be untenable. Every time you impose a new cost, the system adapts to, um, uh, to, to absorb those costs. So you can do it, but at least 
let the decisions that have been made to date stand and let people make their new decisions based on your anti-economic, anti-business, anti-commerce um, view of how things should go. So I think the amendment makes all the sense in the world. I wish we had about a 30 more to fix some other things. I, I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? In that case, the question occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. 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 In, in the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Request a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler? No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? Ms. Jackson Lee? Mr. Cohen? Mr. Johnson of Georgia? No. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch? Ms. Bass? No. Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Jeffries? Mr. Cicilline? No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Liu? Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Demings? No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa? Ms. Scanlon? Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Nagus? Ms. McBath? Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? No. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? No. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Escobar? No. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jones? Ms. Ross? Ross votes no. Ms. Ross votes no. Ms. Bush? Bush votes no. Ms. Bush votes no. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Shabbat? Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Mr. Issa? Mr. Issa? Mr. Buck? Mr. Gates? No. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs? Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock? Aye. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Stubbe? Mr. Both. Tiffany? Aye. Mr. Tiffany votes aye. Mr. Massey? Massey votes aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Roy? Aye. Mr. Roy votes aye. Mr. Bishop? Mr. Bishop votes aye. Ms. Fishbach? Yes. Ms. Fishbach votes yes. Ms. Sparts? Yes. Ms. Sparts votes yes. Mr. Fitzgerald? 
Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Benz? Mr. Benz votes yes. Mr. Owens? Owens, aye. Mr. Owens votes aye. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Ms. Lofgren, you are not recorded. No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Jones, you are not recorded. No. Mr. Jones votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee, you are not recorded. No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? This is Congress. Mr. Issa, you are not recorded. I would be a yes. Mr. Issa votes yes. Mr. Liu? No. Mr. Liu votes no. Uh, how is Ms. Demings recorded? Ms. Demings is recorded as no. Have all members who wish to be recorded been recorded? Mr. Chairman, how, how am I recorded, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Johnson of Georgia, you are recorded as no. The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 15 ayes and 20 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. For our purpose, does Mr. Fitzgerald seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The, the, the Chairman, I reserve a point of order. The clerk will report the amendment. Point of order is reserved. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 963, offered by Mr. Fitzgerald of Wisconsin, page 4, line 16, insert excuse. Amendment is without objection. The amendment is considered as read. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, containers are jammed up in ports around the world due to rising demand and a shortage of dock workers and truckers. This supply chain crisis is one of the administration's own making. The president's economic policies incentivize workers to stay home through reckless unemployment aid, unconstitutional vaccine mandates, and burdensome and nonsensical COVID restrictions. Additionally, inflation continues to rise, pricing parents out of childcare. Energy prices are spiking due to senseless decisions to shut down the Keystone Pipeline and suspend drilling leases on federal lands, increasing the cost of shipping. The supply chain disruptions further pump inflation. This bill will replace, will place new and unnecessary costs on American businesses and ultimately on Americans at a time when they're already reeling from President Biden's failing economic policies. This bill adds to the challenges and further burdens Americans by racing to rewrite millions of agreements and makes running a business even more costly in ways that primarily benefit the trial lawyers. And that matters because individual Americans ultimately shoulder the costs of misguided policies, whether through higher prices or fewer op opportunities. This amendment would attempt to mitigate this crisis by making the arbitration ban inapplicable to employment agreements in critical industries affected by labor shortages or supply chain disruptions. This amendment would reduce the costs the bill would impose on employers and workers by maintaining their access to arbitration, allowing them to quickly and cheaply settle disputes. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment to alleviate the supply chain crisis. And I yield back. Will the gentleman just yield for a question to explain some the amendment a little bit? I will. Thanks. So I, um, I understand the, the intention of the amendment, but um, without some understanding of what the definition of an industry affected by labor shortages, which presumably could be change every day, or supply chain disruptions, without definitions of what those mean, the amendment feels like it would be impossible to actually implement. So I, I get the objective, yeah. but I just, I'm afraid that it's fraught with 
kind of where does where how are those terms defined in, in terms of application? Yeah, we talked about critical industries, and you know, I think it was it was kind of the door was left open on that part of the definition uh, because it's pretty hard to anticipate kind of what sectors could be directly affected. So I, I understand the, the question. We did discuss kind of how that could be further defined. Uh, it, it might it might result in another amendment being offered, um, and I would yield to my friend, Mr. Tiffany. Yeah, th thank you very much. I mean, think about all the things that have been disrupted, you know, computer chips, shipping of all types, energy producers and transporters, uh, farmers, egg processors that uh, take that stuff from the field and make sure it gets to the farm table. Um, transporters of agricultural products, you could just name it. You know, it's kind of like back when uh, the definition, I remember in Wisconsin, we were, we had the lockdown that came about a year and a half ago, and they said, uh, you can stay open if you're an essential business. Whose business is not essential? You know, think about back when, uh, I, I think about the, 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 the big supermarkets that were allowed to be stay, stay open, and they would have a floral department. Well, the local florist, she got shut down, but the big supermarket didn't. It w so my point is that you have all of these things that have contributed to this massive supply chain disruption that we've had in America. And the current administration wants to make it worse with vaccine mandates. It's already been bad enough with mask mandates that we see at our schools, which the voters in Virginia made very clear they're tired of lockdowns and shutdowns and having their kids not. And remember, it wasn't just critical race theory last night that was on the ballot. It was just also the lockdowns and shutdowns where, and mask mandates where your kids can't go to school, they don't learn and stuff like that. Parents are sick of it. And so I think you can lump just about everything in here because it all goes into the supply chain directly. And I think this is, um, I think this is, a, this is a really good amendment. And I think about the comment um, earlier, if I may take another few seconds, uh, a gentleman from Wisconsin. Um, you know, we had the comment earlier about David versus Goliath, and um, you know, David doesn't always win. Well, you know what? David made a lot of noise last night and said, hey, you better turn things around. This is one of them. They would like to have Christmas presents this year for their kids. They would like for their energy products to be able to be transported. They're tired of the lockdowns, shutdowns out in California where they can't even unload a ship. I love some of the memes that are out there that show people um, supposedly um, wading out to the ships to get their presents for Christmas. And that's the kind of stuff that we're seeing in America at this point. Now, while we understand that that's just a meme and it's ridiculous and all the rest, there's an element of truth in it. That's what makes it so funny. And it is time to stop this unnecessary, the lockdowns, the shutdowns, all this stuff. David is saying, we want our America back. I yield back to the gentleman from Wisconsin. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does, does Mr. Johnson seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. I rise in opposition to the amendment. Um, I'll note that last night the Atlanta Braves made a heck of a lot of uh, noise in winning the World Series, but that is outside of the scope of this hearing, as is the supply chain economics and uh, vaccine mandates. Uh, mask mandates, critical race theory, abortion, immigration, all of the other uh, hot button issues that uh, my colleagues like to press, uh, those things are outside of the scope of this uh, piece of important legislation that protects consumers and workers and levels the playing field for those uh, people, the little guy, against the big businesses that my friends are working so hard and diligently on the other side to protect. Uh, I ask my colleagues to vote against this amendment and to pay short shrift to all of the amendments that are about to be introduced on critical race theory and vaccine mandates and uh, 
and uh, mask mandates and stay-at-home orders and, and the like. Uh, and with that, I yield back. Would the gentleman yield to me? I yield to the ch chair. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. I just want to say that uh, I agree with Mr. Tiffany, and, and he made an excellent point. Everything is included in this amendment. A person in industry affected by labor shortages or supply chain disruptions. Anybody can claim that that is the case. Um, and any industry may have labor shortages at any time, and the supply chain may dis be disrupted at any time. And if the supply chain is disrupted, it affects every single industry. So, in effect, this amendment simply repeals the bill, and I uh, oppose it for that reason because I think the bill is very necessary for all the reasons that have been stated uh, this morning and early this afternoon so far. And I yield back to the gentleman. I yield back. For what purpose does Mr. Shabbat seek recognition? Move the the one gentleman one. is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first, I'd like to thank the uh, gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald, for offering uh, Ooh, a great amendment here. Um, given our nation's supply chain issues, as he mentioned, uh, brought on uh, by the coronavirus pandemic and made worse by the policies of uh, President Biden and many of his allies here in Congress, Mr. Fitzgerald's amendment would, uh, if this legislation actually ever became law, uh, help America's businesses to, uh, you know, to avoid being tied up in endless litigation over disputes that might adversely uh, impact our nation's supply chain. Over the last several months, our nation has faced major issues with our supply chain. There are ships backed up, up and down, especially the West Coast, um, and uh, there's cargo on those ships, and they, we can't unload it, and then there are insufficient trucks to bring it in, and then we've uh, been paying people not to come to work, so that's been an additional uh, issue, uh, and so it's been a total mess. Um, and shopping for everyday items has already uh, been impacted and the unprecedented delays threaten uh, to have a major impact on the upcoming uh, Christmas shopping season. Um, the Biden administration's policies and the legislation that we're considering today would uh, likely have the effect of only making matters worse, unfortunately. It's problematic uh, because it would essentially outlaw arbitration provisions in private contracts which have for nearly a century provided efficiencies uh, in our judicial system. Uh, unfortunately, the legislation that we're uh, considering today would have the effect of producing more individual and class action lawsuits uh, that will do little more than benefit the plaintiff's attorneys uh, who bring them. Uh, unsurprisingly, it creates a carve out and for the very folks that the Democrats always predictably seek to protect unions. Um, this, despite the fact that research has shown that employees generally obtain more favorable judgments in arbitration than they do in court. And obviously, they get them on a much more timely basis because it doesn't take nearly as long, and the trial lawyers don't take as much of the money out of the judgment. Uh, and for the same reason, instead of strengthening arbitration, um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at this legislation today. It's just, it's wrongheaded. Um, but I thank the gentleman from Wisconsin for offering uh, his amendment. Uh, gentleman, I, I'd be happy to yield to the gentleman from North Carolina. I thank the gentleman from Ohio. It was suggested that this is irrelevant uh, to the bill before us. But I think you could ask yourself three quick questions and see. Of course, again, what this says is uh, you're going to exclude a person in, in this, from, from the ban on arbitration agreements. You're going to exclude a person in an industry affected by labor shortages or supply chain disruptions. And so the question is, first question, do you think the problem exists? That is to say, do you think there is a problem with labor shortages and supply chain disruptions? Two, do you think it is causing harm? And three, do you think it would be made a lot better by a tidal wave of lawsuits about it? Would that help? because that's what this bill produces. It's a great example of a disruptions in commercial relationships, dis disruptions in contractual relationships. That's what the labor shortages and the supply chain disruptions are all about. So would it be benefited if you said in every case, you gotta go into the slow motion process of court and, uh, and spend your time and, and energy there, whoever you are, however you are affected,
every consumer who's disappointed by the fact that Biden's going to keep presents from being in the hands of kids by Christmas because of the disastrous management of the, of the economy. Is that better if we have a lot of lawsuits relating to that? If the answer is yes, then I could see why you'd be in favor of this legislation. But the amendment is a great one as far as I'm concerned. And I, Mr. Uh, Shabbat, I yield back to you. Thank you. Reclaiming my time, and I'll yield back. The gentleman yields back. What purpose does Mr. Gates seek recognition? I'll move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. What we witnessed in debate on this amendment was quite remarkable. Uh, Mr. Tiffany criticized the Biden administration for creating different segments of Americans in the workforce. And he was totally correct in doing so. I associate myself with those comments completely. But then he did so debating for an amendment that quite literally seeks to divide people based on these artificial conditions. I believe that the entire American workforce is essential. And I believe that workforce should be supported by the judicial system that those workers pay for. Now, the Fitzgerald Amendment obviously fails on basic definitional terms because we can't possibly support an amendment that doesn't define the operative terms of the amendment. But, but certainly, the, the amendment ripens the principal question in the legislation, which is, should we have one tier of justice and one system of justice to resolve certain kinds of resolutions and other, another wave of justice, another opportunity that uh, operates differently and that might have the scales tilted in favor of one entity or another. Now, I've heard many of my colleagues on the Republican side talk about the cost savings of arbitration. And I can just share with you as a practitioner in my personal experience, there are times when arbitration costs less, there are times when arbitration costs more. And by the way, the variance in cost is far lower in these construction defect cases we've talked about. I, again, I've arbitrated disputes around construction defects, I've litigated them. And because of the expert costs and because the technical nature, whether you're in court or before an arbitration panel, those costs are pretty similar. You, it's far more often driven by the circumstances of the case than the method of dispute resolution. But even if the argument is true that arbitration is cheaper for workers, there is almost no evidence that's been presented that it is more just. And I would propose to the Judiciary Committee, the August Judiciary Committee, that cheap injustice makes for a cheap nation. And if justice is too difficult for people to achieve economically, then let us turn our entire focus to that for the sake of all Americans. But I, I oppose the Fitzgerald Amendment for precisely the reasons that I oppose the Biden administration's efforts to separate and divide different workers. As, as an American populist, I think all of our workers should have fair, equal justice, and I believe we should make it cost-effective for them. Uh, and this amendment, uh, while giving my Republicans the ability to talk about the massive supply chain failures of the Biden administration, which I totally agree with, does not belong in this bill. And, and if there are any of my colleagues that would seek time, I'd be happy to yield. Oh, I would do this. If Mr. Shabbat is still around, Mr. Shabbat uh, made reference to some data where people who are workers in arbitration prevail more often than businesses. I would yield to Mr. Shabbat so that I could maybe get that citation and, and review that evidence. We'll be happy to make that available to the gentleman from Florida. Uh, Mr. It, Gates? Does, does the gentleman have it now, or is it uh, just for the sake I, of the- I've already uh, responded to the gentleman. Thank you. Mr. Gates, would you yield? I would. So I, I wanted to make sure I understood what you were getting at. You, you said, are you saying, you said we should turn our, devote our entire efforts to making litigation uh, inexpensive and effective. Uh, it's been evolving well, in the United States I for believe. 200 I, I and something I years. In, I, no, no, no I, I said efficient, not, not inexpensive. Not, okay, efficient, not inexpensive. Okay. It, it, it may be too uh, broad a question for the uh, time left, but the system has been evolving for 200 years. Um, what, what, what do you see, what do you envision as the change that will make it so efficient uh, that it will become a better instrument of justice? Um, well, that's, that, that is a broad question. I support loser pay laws. Uh, I think those are particularly helpful in discouraging frivolous litigation. And 
you know, I think there's too much motion practice. And, and if we had more judges, we would probably be able to move more litigation um, more efficiently. If, if but the, uh, it's if probably the gentleman, a broader conversation. If the gentleman would yield. Uh, sure, Mr. Johnson. Uh, yes, I, I definitely wanted to concur in that last point that you made about increasing the size of the judiciary. I've got legislation that would create 203 additional district court judgeships uh, to speed up the uh, flow of justice. And I'd ask my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to support that legislation. That'll make litigation more efficient. Well, specifically in the context of these employment disputes, a lot of that arises under state yeah. law. So I don't want to overassume that, that the federal government has too big a role to play in that. The time of the gentleman has expired. Does anyone else seek recognition? In that case, the question occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. And the amendment is not agreed to. The recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler. No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren. No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. No. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch. Ms. Bass. No. Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Jeffries. Mr. Cicilline. No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Liu. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Dimmings? No. Ms. Dimmings votes no. Mr. Correa? Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Nagus. Ms. McBath. No. Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton. No. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean. No. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Escobar. No. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jones. Ms. Ross. Ross votes no. Ms. Ross votes no. Ms. Bush. Bush votes no. Ms. Bush votes no. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Chabot. Mr. Chabot votes aye. Mr. Gomert. Mr. Gomert votes aye. Mr. Isa. Aye. Mr. Isa votes aye. Mr. Buck. Uh, aye. Aye. Mr. Buck votes aye. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. No. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs. Aye. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock. Aye. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Stubbe. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes aye. Mr. Massey. Massey votes aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Roy. Aye. Mr. Roy votes aye. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop votes yes. 
Ms. Fishbach? Ms. Sparts? Yes. Ms. Sparts votes yes. Mr. Fitzgerald? <laughs> Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Benz? Mr. Benz votes yes. Mr. Owens? Owens, aye. Mr. Owens votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee? Ms. Jackson, am I recorded? I'm unrecorded. Ms. Jackson Lee, you're not recorded. No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. This is Congressman Cohen. I'm not recorded, and I'd like to be a no. Mr. Cohen votes no. Thank you. Uh, Deutsch votes no. Mr. Deutsch votes no. Has everyone uh, who wishes to be recorded been recorded? Mr. Chair, how is Fishbach recorded? Ms. Fishbach, you are not recorded. Fishbach votes aye. Ms. Fishbach votes aye. How is uh, Mr. Liu recorded? Mr. Liu, you are not recorded. I vote no. Mr. Liu votes no. How is Mr. Nagoose recorded? Mr. Nagoose, you're not recorded. Nagoose votes no. Mr. Nagoose votes no. Are there any other people who, uh, members who wish to be recorded who haven't been recorded? The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 16 ayes and 22 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there any further amendments to the amendment in nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman. For what purposes does Mr. Fitzgerald seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Mr. Chairman, I preserve a point of order. The clerk will report the amendment. The point of order is reserved. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 963 offered by Mr. Fitzgerald of Wisconsin, page 6, strike line Without 16. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is the amendment that uh, we've all been waiting for. It's the Help Me, Help You amendment. Uh, Mr. Shabbat just brought it up earlier. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this amendment would simply remove the blatant inconsistency in the bill. Instead of setting one standard and having everyone play by the same rules, the Democrats have singled out the unions for favorable treatment. This legislation bans pre-dispute arbitration for non-union employees while preserving these benefits for union employees. Arbitration offers a faster and cheaper path to resolution on a dispute, and my amendment would remove this carve out for union employees and restore parity between union and non union workers. So, everything that was said this morning and this afternoon about the bill, if you believe that issues related to sexual assault, discrimination, anything that could end up in arbitration. If you believe that that's what makes this bill worth taking up today and having a full markup on is all good stuff, why is there a specific segment of citizens that this should not apply to? And, and, I, and maybe I missed it. Maybe there's a good answer for this. But that's what this amendment would do. It's time to clean up the bill and fix this, and I would yield back. Thank you, the gentleman yields back. I withdraw my point of order. I now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. And I rise in opposition to this amendment. 
Uh, the FAIR Act prohibits the enforcement of forced arbitration clauses for workers and consumers with cases against corporations, and the bill contains an exemption for negotiated arbitration provisions as part of a labor union's collective bargaining agreement. And this amendment would uh, strike that provision, and for that reason I oppose. Uh, collective bargaining agreements uh, containing arbitration clauses come as a result of a heavily negotiated process between two entities that have rel relatively equal bargaining power. Conversely, forced arbitration, which is what the legislation gets, that, gets at, is thrust upon workers and consumers individually who have no bargaining power and no ability to negotiate the terms with the corporation, and it always hurts the uh, consumer or the employer. And for that reason, uh, I ask my colleagues to uh, vote against this amendment, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Gates seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. What is good for the goose should be good for the gander. And I find myself in strong agreement with Representative Fitzgerald's amendment. Uh, look, I mean, the, the powerful taking advantage of the weak is what we are working to preserve. The U.S. taxpayer-funded justice system is what we're trying to preserve. And if there should not be an off-ramp for powerful businesses, there should also not be an off-ramp for powerful unions. So I, I find myself as perhaps the most intellectually consistent member of the Judiciary Committee, because I suspect I will be the only proponent of the bill who will also vote for this good amendment. And I thank my colleague for offering it. And I yield back. Mr. Gates, we will not put that uh, question to a vote um, <laughs> out of respect to you. Uh, is this else? amendment is the vote, Mr. Cicilline. <laughs> That's correct. Uh, anyone else seek recognition? If not, the question occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those aye. opposed say nay. Nay. Opinion of the chair, the nays Mr. have it. Mr. Chairman, yeas and nays, please. The, a recorded vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler. Ms. Lofgren. Ms. Jackson Lee. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Oh. Cohen. No. Lofgren votes no. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch. Ms. Bass. No. Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Jeffries. Mr. Cicilline. No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Liu. No. Mr. Liu votes no. Mr. Raskin. Ms. Jayapal. One second. I just have to vote really quickly. Okay. Ms. Jayapal. Jayapal votes. Uh, how did the chairman vote? I'm sorry. <laughs> chairman intends to vote no. Okay. No. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Drypaul votes no. Ms. Demings? No. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa? Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? No. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Nagus. Ms. McBath. Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton. No. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean. No. 
Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Escobar? No. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jones? Ms. Ross? Ross votes no. Ms. Ross votes no. Ms. Bush? Bush votes no. Ms. Bush votes no. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Shabbat? Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Aye. Mr. Gomert votes aye. Mr. Issa? From the Senate side, I vote aye. Mr. Issa votes aye. Mr. Buck? Aye. Mr. Buck votes aye. Mr. Gates? I don't know if that was a cry for help from Mr. Issa, but I vote aye. Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs. Mr. McClintock. Aye. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Stubbe. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Massey. Massey votes aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Roy. Aye. Mr. Roy votes aye. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop votes yes. Ms. Fishbach. Yes. Ms. Fishbach votes yes. Ms. Sparts. Yes. Ms. Sparts votes yes. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Benz. Mr. Benz votes yes. Mr. Owens. Owens, aye. Mr. Owens votes aye. Mr. Chairman, this is uh, Zoe Lofgren. How, how am I recorded? Ms. Lofgren, you are not recorded. I vote a no. Ms. Lofgren votes no. I vote no. Mr. Nadler votes no. How am I recorded? It's Raskin. Mr. Raskin, you are not recorded. I vote no. Mr. Raskin votes no. Mr. Chairman, Deutsch votes no. Mr. Deutsch votes no. Correa votes no. Mr. Correa votes no. Are there any members who haven't been recorded who wish to be recorded? How is Ms. Jackson? How is Ms. Jackson Lee recorded? Ms. Jackson Lee is recorded as no. Uh, the, the clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 15 ayes and 21 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there any other amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? In that case, the question occurs on the amendment in the nature of a substitute. This will be followed immediately by a vote on final passage of the bill. All those in favor respond by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Aye. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment in the nature of a substitute is agreed to. A reporting quorum being present, the question is on the motion to report the bill H.R. 963 as amended favorably to the House. Those in favor respond by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it, and the bill is ordered reported favorably. A recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. <laughs> Mr. Cohen. Aye. Mr. Cohen votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Deutsch? Aye. Mr. Deutsch votes aye. Ms. Bass? Aye. Ms. Bass votes aye. Mr. Jeffries? Mr. Cicilline? Aye. Mr. Cicilline votes aye. Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Liu? Mr. Raskin? Aye. 
Mr. Raskin votes aye. Ms. Jayapal. Aye. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Ms. Stimmings. Aye. Ms. Stimmings votes aye. Mr. Correa. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Ms. Garcia. Aye. Ms. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Nagus. Ms. McBath. Ms. McBath votes aye. Mr. Stanton. Aye. Mr. Stanton votes aye. Ms. Dean. Aye. Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar. Ms. Escobar. Ms. Escobar. Yes. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. How did the chairman vote? Chairman voted aye. Yes. This is final passage. Ms. Escobar uh, votes aye. Nagus votes aye. Mr. Jones. Uh, Mr. Nagus votes aye. aye. Mr. Jones votes aye. Ms. Ross. Ross votes aye. Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush. Bush votes aye. Let me remind all members to uh, wait until the end of the roll call. Ms. Bush votes aye. Mr. Jordan. Would you? Mr. Shabbat. Mr. Gomert. Aye. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Mr. Gomert no. votes no. Yeah. Mr. Isa. Yeah. And once again, I am not hostage in the Senate, but I am over on the other side, and I will vote no. Mr. Issa votes no. Mr. Buck? No. Mr. Buck votes no. Mr. Gates? Mr. Gates? Aye. Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? How did the chairman vote? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes no. Mr. Biggs? No. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock? No. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Stubbe? Mr. Tiffany? Mr. Massey? How did Matt Gates vote? <laughs> How did Mr. Gates vote? Mr. Gates voted aye. I'm voting no. <laughs> Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy? Um, no. Mr. Roy votes no. Mr. Bishop? No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Ms. Fishbach? No. Ms. Fishbach votes no. Ms. Sparts? No. Ms. Sparts votes no. Mr. Fitzgerald? Mr. Fitzgerald votes no. Mr. Benz. Mr. Benz votes no. Mr. Owens. Owens no. Mr. Owens votes no. Mr. Nagus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Nagus votes aye. Mr. Nagus votes aye. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Raskin, you recorded as aye. Thank you. Quick report. One second. One second.
Mr. Chair, how am I recorded? Mr. Liu, you are not recorded. Aye. Mr. Liu votes aye. How has Mr. Cicilline been recorded? Mr. Cicilline is recorded as I. A clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 23 ayes and 14 noes. The ayes have it and the bill is amended as ordered reported favorably to the House. Members will have two days to submit views. Without objection, the bill will be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute incorporating all adopted amendments. The staff is authorized to make technical and conforming Changes. We are now going to consider four codification bills and block. Pursuant to notice, I call up H.R. 5677 to make technical amendments to Titles 250 and 52, United States Code. H.R. 5679 to make technical amendments to Titles 720 and 43, United States Code. H.R. 5695 to make technical amendments to Title 25, United States Code and H.R. 5705 to make technical amendments to Title 34, United States Code, for purposes of markup. Without objection, I move that the committee report and block the bills favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bills. H.R. 5677 to make technical amendments. Without objection, the bills are considered as read and open for amendment at any point. I will begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. One of the important responsibilities the House gives this committee is to oversee the, quote, revision and codification of the statutes of the United States, unquote. Keeping track of the new laws Congress passes every session is a formidable challenge, but it is an essential part of maintaining the rule of law in our country, and it is a duty we take seriously on this committee. The body of federal law is so large and complex at this point that it would be almost completely unmanageable without the United States Code. Currently consisting of 54 titles, the code compiles the general and permanent laws of the United States into coherent subject areas. Many of, this, many of us on this committee, for example, are familiar with Title 11 of the code, which contains the bankruptcy laws, Title 28, which governs the federal courts, and Title 17, which contains copyright laws. The next title, Title 18, covers criminal law and procedure, a topic that occupies so much of this committee's work. The code makes our federal laws accessible both to the government officials who work to fairly administer them and to the private citizens who seek the benefits or relief the law provides them. The code did not appear magically out of thin air. Congress created it in 1926, and since that time it has been painstakingly constructed and updated by expert lawyers working under the supervision of the House. We, owe a we all owe a great deal to the Office of Law Revision Council, OLRC, whose attorneys ably carry out their statutory mandate, quote, to develop and keep current an official and positive codification of the laws of the United States, close quote, while maintaining strict impartiality as to legislative policy. The four codification bills we are taking up today are H.R. 5677, sponsored by Representative Madeline Dean, H.R. 5679, sponsored by Representative Mondair Jones, H.R. 5695, sponsored by Representative Darrell Issa, and H.R. 5705, sponsored by Representative Cliff Bentz. I want to thank each of these members for introducing this legislation. OLRC calls these bill editorial reclassification bills because they make conforming changes to statutes that have been impacted by OLRC's reorganization efforts. For example, in 2014, OLRC reorganized the voting and election statutes into a single title, Title 52 of the Code. I want to make it very clear that the statutory changes made by this bill and others we, are, we, others we are considering today are purely technical in nature. They do not change the meaning or effect of any existing laws. They are part of an ongoing effort to maintain the Code as an authoritative, accurate, and accessible source of federal law. I would like to thank our four colleagues who have introduced these bills. I'm glad we can fulfill our responsibility to keep the Code updated in a bipartisan manner. Uh, we are working with OLRC to schedule additional codification bills 
in the coming months, and I urge all members to support these four bills. I now recognize Mr. Johnson for, an, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. We, we do thank you for your bipartisan approach to introducing these bills, and we also want to thank the Office of Law Revision Council. As you noted, OLRC is a small office in the House of Representatives that's responsible for preparing and publishing the United States Code. They do the tedious work of bringing order to the laws that this Congress enacts, and every Congress. And as a result of their work, the law is more readable and accessible to the American people. These bills are often many years in the works before they're advanced to this committee, and so we acknowledge all that effort. The bills before us today make technical corrections, as you said, only to update internal references throughout the code, and this is done to help all Americans understand what our code says. We look forward to continuing to work with our Judiciary Committee colleagues on these types of good government bills. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. For what purpose does Ms. Dean seek recognition? Uh, I move to strike the last word. General ladies recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, H.R. 5677 would make technical amendments and edits to Titles 250 and 52 of the U.S. Code. As you have pointed out, one of the important responsibilities we have as members of Congress is to oversee the revision and codification of our laws, which is, which is what makes these types of bills incredibly important. We keep track of new laws Congress has passed and ensure that they are consistent with existing law. While we spend most time speaking about very particular codes, such as Title 28, Federal Courts, or Title 18 that discusses criminal law and procedure, there are many, many more. This bill will ensure that there is uniformity in our code. We are a country governed by laws which require maintenance. This legislation will impact the Americans with Disabilities Act, war and national defense, and voting in elections. While this is not exciting legislation, these discrete uh, codification changes are important to maintaining consistency in our laws. I thank the committee for their work in maintaining our laws and the Office of the Law Revision Council for their great work. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Jones seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, I'm proud to introduce H.R. 5679, uh, legislation to update, reorganize, and streamline Title 7, 20, and 43 of the United States Code. I want to thank the chairman for bringing this legislation before the committee, and I'd also like to thank the Office of the Law Revision Council for its work to develop this legislation and all of the codification bills under our consideration today. This bill is part of the Judiciary Committee's exercise of its responsibility to revise and codify the laws of the United States. All this, although this legislation is technical and makes no substantive changes to the law, I'm glad that this committee is dedicated to making our laws clearer and more accessible. In advancing those values, this bill is a small part of fulfilling our constitutional duty to establish justice. Specifically, my bill would codify three changes. First, the bill would streamline Title VII, the main body of law concerning agriculture. Second, the bill would reorganize provisions concerning public lands. Third and finally, my bill would unite and clarify federal education law. I'm pleased that this bill would reunite the provisions of Title IV of the Higher Education Act of 1965 into one title in the U.S. Code, Title XX. As a result, the federal laws concerning student financial aid which had previously been scattered across two titles of the code would be located in the same place. The Judiciary Committee approved a version of this legislation in the 115th Congress, so I'm hopeful that we can come together to approve this updated version of that effort and ultimately pass it into law this Congress. I so look forward to your support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman, yield, the gentleman yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? In that case, the reporting quorum being present, the question is now on reporting the bills and block favorably to the House. Those in favor respond by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the bills are ordered reported favorably. Um, uh, members will have two days to submit views. Yeah, there you go. 
This concludes our business for today. Thanks to all our members for attending. Without objection, the markup is adjourned. <laughs>